he can uh, somehow off with their heads to kind of join. That's awesome. Uh, at the time, what the council was, and so yeah, I never even thought I'd be involved in any of that stuff. I just wanted to get playing again. I remember when you applied, and I was like, "That was good." I was I was happy to that to, that to see you throw your hat in the ring on that. Yeah. You're much better at it. No, or you were much better at it. Well, <laughs> thank you, thank you. No, I, I I had the job of being the front man. I I just made it my own and ran with it. Well, at least you had two bodyguards and Rob and I. So. <laughs> Boy, howdy! <laughs> you guys were like my entourage, keeping people away from me if necessary. We were both bouncers in the, the 90s, so at some point. <laughs> bouncers, yeah? Yeah. It's, a, it's Rob Silva passed away a few years ago. February 7th was triad with us. We were good friends. and Yeah. Um, but Rob and I had a lot in common. We both came from big cities. Uh, you know, both studied philosophy. Both worked in bars. So, wait a minute. You were, uh, Pat, you were, you were Roadhouse. Philosophy oh. major? No. He I was. That's what that. Patrick Swayze's character sure. was. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it was planned. Uh, I, that's I went awesome. in for chemistry. So. That's awesome. Roadhouse is a good comparison. Man. <laughs> that that is hilarious. That I don't think hilarious. any other tribe member has been able to say that. Well, so buy more. Ask, if you ask people who know me and met over the years, I've had about twenty years of relations with people in Wisconsin, oh, what's up? in Chicago, and. And I, I think that everybody's got at least one story, bad or good, about me. So you don't have to ask around. My mileage definitely varies. Oh, as you can see, Jay is playing these ads, so our audio is now live. Just yeah, we're, we're allowed to talk over this. Yeah, that's all right. That's our shtick. It's the pre-show. It's the yep. pre-show. Is there a that's theme right. song? Oops. Do we sing it? You can yeah, sing. Yeah, sure. Look, look, I just hit the wrong button. Hello, I just said the stream was ending. What's up, Zump? Holy cow. Yeah, I know. I make a lot of mis button mistakes on my... all the time. Plus, I'm exhausted tonight. It's been a long work week already. I don't know what it is. What it is. Maybe because it's February. But January, you get back into the swing, but February's been... Uh, you know? It's kind of drags. You wait for spring. Yeah. Hey, that's, Mike. That's true. What's going hey. on, Mike? Hey, Mark. Oh, yeah. Hey, guys. Now it got deadly quiet when Mike came on. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's like we're plotting. Mike's here. Shut up. Oh, crap. We got two mics. Mike, Michael, do you prefer Michael? Menza. Menza? Just call you Menza. Menza. Thanks. Yeah. Everybody calls me. Oh, yeah, that right. that, that name now. sort of is invocative. It's like a title. Oh, yeah. All right. Ah. It's gone, everyone. Look, uh, nice and early, everyone is. Woohoo! Casey, I didn't start to get me yet. But I will. Will eventually. No, the storm's not going to hit me at all, New Jersey. No. We're not getting it. South Jersey's not getting this storm at all. We may get some ice on Friday. That's it. Yep. Yeah, we have wind like crazy today. So it's really that would be Yeah, Massachusetts, we got our storm last weekend. Two feet, right? Yeah, yeah, about somewhere between 18 to 24 inches in our yard here. Well, thank you, Vernon. Vernon hitting up with a tier one. Hey, I'm here for you. That is awesome, thank you. By the way, Vern, since the last time you've been here, I got this little check mark next to my name, so Ooh. I made Twitch partner after three and a half years. So Is that like getting partner in a law firm or something? Uh it's kind of, except you know, you, you bend over it's more better. here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> Just kidding. Right, Longer prison, prison rules. I, I yeah. work for the state, so I, I know the feeling. Ghost Door. So, Hi, Michael. It's Sean and Adrian from the Ghost Door. That was someone who just oh. followed. So there you go. Sean and Adrian. Awesome. Men's up Michael, to give you some background on Jay, he's been running a Greyhawk campaign for over 40 years in his basement, which is like a, the Taj Mahal of <laughs> free terrain. 
<laughs> set up. But he never played Living Greyhawk, even though he was right next to the airport where Keelan used to have yeah. their no con yeah. in uh, Jersey. So oh. we've been doing these shows for about two or three years now. They've been hugely. Look at that. We got a hype train already. We're nowhere near to starting. You guys are amazing. <laughs> Julie Cat, thank you. He like said, Welcome. Yeah, Dale, Dale's right about that. His players aren't allowed to leave the basement unless they uh, get sick. Yes. <laughs> or use the restroom. Or find a way out. Man, could you out. imagine living with Tim, though? But do they have a mysterious Tim? No. 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 Fun, no, no. fun is a DM. Oh. I just could not imagine living with. Michael, thanks for following. Uh, Menza, thank you for following yesterday. I see it says you followed yesterday. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. No, um, I wanted to see what's going on. <laughs> Tim's a little, uh, yeah, Tim's out there. I'm kind of scared, uh, Casey. For the fundraiser, you know, Tim's going to be helping me on the bad guy side, and I'm really scared because, uh-huh. uh, you know, he's going to attempt to kill everyone. And I'm like, you don't kill people during a fundraiser. You Just don't let Tom... Roll any dice. <laughs> Tom is banned from rolling. <laughs> yeah, but if Tim is... Again. Yeah. All right. Uh, Walt, I don't recall being that bad. Tom should be, like, embarrassed at how bad he was rolling. Julie, that's awesome. If you're on TEE and 5 e that's really cool. Great to hear. Look at that. We already got a level one hype train completed. Thank you, everyone. Very kind. All yeah, right, and next. for those of you in the storm, I hope everyone stays safe, yes. stays warm, and has a gas-powered snowblower. I had an electric one that died a few weeks before our big storm here in Massachusetts, and I went and bought a gas one, and it was the best decision I've made in quite some time. So you want to go to I, Greyhawk I, Online or Cannon Fire websites? Sorry for the environment. Julie. Needed the gas one. Cannon Fire or Cannon Fire websites or Cannon Fire or Greyhawk Online websites. But if you want Discords. The Greyhawk Online Discord is attached uh, to their site, but I can link the Cannon Fire Discord. Give me a sec here. The Flanez Geographic Society, I hear, is a pretty decent Facebook group. They are a pretty good Facebook group, too, absolutely. I mean, I've just heard rumors about it. <laughs> Got a lot of Facebook groups. You've been there enough to have an opinion, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, for anyone interesting, Michael created the cowled lady, so you can uh, talk to him about her. One of our uh, villains for uh, year five. Nice. What? Damn. The cowled lady was one of the three main villains in our region, the Wicked Three. And, uh, the cow Michael, lady? Cow. The cow, cowled. Cowled. Oh, yeah, cow oh, lady. Sorry. She's half cow, half lady. Yes. Yes. The cow lick. Yes, yes. half of yes. like a Man cow, man bear pig. All the anthropomorphic stuff in Greyhawk. Yeah. She is. She is. Well, we Wayne, so thank you so very much for, for that, for hitting us over that level two there, Hype Train, already. So we got giveaways tonight from uh, Troller Games and uh, one from uh, classic, some classic re, uh, D&D reprints. So we'll have three tonight. Um, yeah. Two of them. Uh, it, um, Chuck it. Can we win them? What's that? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When I set the drawing, you're gonna exclamation point add, drawing add, up. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Oh my gosh, Troy! Troy hitting us up with five tier one uh, gift subs. Wow, that was very kind, Troy. Thank you. That was really nice of you. Really appreciate it. Starting off the month strong here. It yeah, is second February, Louis right? Greyhound show. It is. February. What is this? Two two twenty two. Yes. It's a bunch of twos today. Oh my gosh, and Wayne comes back with five! Oh my gosh. So, uh, wait, uh, Menza, a lot of things, you know, I gotta make sure I don't use co- uh, copyrighted song material, you know, all the deal, so. That's been a lot. That's been a learning experience over these last three and a half years. Oh my gosh! You guys are going insane! <laughs> oh my gosh! I so that was just 15. Oh my. You, wow. Nuts. All right, we're gonna get to. We're gonna start. We'll start early. How's that sound, everyone? We'll start early, seven minutes. Get a little extra uh, show time in. 
Welcome to some living Greyhawk Verbal Park Triads. Returning Vernon Vincent, first time Michael Menza. Welcome and thank you. Uh, as uh, we uh, see some, uh, some unbelievable stuff I have uh, that we can discuss tonight as we're going to talk about the Meta Orgs and Casey Brown who put this together as well with Mike and Anna and me. So here we go. We'll come live now. And it's going to be going, dude, dude, yeah, this is going to be going for a while and he's just subscribed. Good evening, everyone. As we're like six minutes early, but who gives a shit, right? <laughs> it's where? Yes, it, it, so uh, we're at three hundred seventeen percent of a level five hype train already. I want to say thank you, everyone. That was really kind and generous uh, of you all. Uh, in particular, uh, Troy, Wayne, Clever, thank you, and all the other people. Um, always hitting. Well, that's good. Good to hear. Um, so I'm excited about this show. First one in February. Great to topic for discussion. Casey, how these meta orgs come about? Was it Zeef? And we're like, oh my gosh, look at all this cool stuff. And then we said we got to have discussions on other ones. Yeah, I think so. I think last summer uh, we had the Zeif show and it just kind of was very well received. And, and of course, uh, it was just a great show. So the goal for 2022 is to keep them rolling. Absolutely. We, yeah, we've we had uh, we've got Ket coming up in march okay nice uh, just early shout out there that is a good one uh just as long as it's not the time i'm at gary con or the time mike Ann and i are at gary con all at the same time that last now march 2nd we've got that date locked in. awesome very good so let's welcome our, our guests tonight as as with me always is anna meyer and, and, and uh, the great greyhawk mike bridges both of them casey and brown who always comes in during all living greyhawk discussions which is wonderful and our uh, our brand new first time guest here uh michael menza michael welcome thanks and for having me my pleasure our pleasure and, and, and vernon vincent welcome back vernon welcome oh, back, thank vernon. you very much for having us so michael why don't you tell everyone a little about yourself since it's the first time you've been on what uh how you got into living greyhawk and uh, some history of, of what you did for uh, uh during that time frame um well i i was looking to get back into uh D, D. uh they were launching living greyhawk i saw an ad like many people did who uh, were not part of the RPGA at the time, didn't participate in Living City. Uh, I ended up uh, going to my first uh, weekend, weekend of a row bunk, uh, met a couple people there, liked what I was playing, searched out other games, and then found out that uh, I played the first three adventures and there was nothing else for, for a bunk. And at which point, uh, after a couple months, I uh, became a little unruly and <laughs> tried to start a revolt against our triad. In year one. <laughs> In year one. And, uh, Who and we were those members? Any, oh, Who were those triads that you tried to uh, revolt uh, against? I, I don't want to really kind of get into name dropping or anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, it, and really, our triad was actually, uh, at that time, only really two people. Uh, and uh, Lon Latiman was doing an amazing job. I loved his writing. And... He helped me uh, get better at writing once I eventually started writing. And, um, you know, and then, you know, there was another member who was really trying hard to kind of keep it together. But, you know, many times when you try to manage something too closely and, and don't give people a chance to kind of participate or look for writers, um, things tend to slow down. And so um, I definitely would have done it differently at this age than I would have done in my 30s. But, uh, yeah, I was kind of stirring a pot and... And I didn't know anything about conventions, game days, or whatever. And eventually, within six months, I was running game days. I eventually uh, uh, created a partnership with Cheryl Ruby, and we started running Stuffed Cows over Thanksgiving weekend, and did that for a number of years. And um, But at some point, I got, uh, it was, I'll call it appeasement, uh, where uh, I was asked to join the council uh for illinois indiana verbal bank and uh, at that point that's when i think i got a writing assignment and started writing for the meta Wars. and i think the first one was the mounted borders and that kind of uh took off everybody liked it that's my understanding maybe they lied to me <laughs> i don't know but uh say yeah, that I, again Ver verbal bank was illinois and indiana you, yes you might give a quick rundown of the regional system for the audience members who aren't familiar with living greyhawk yeah, I mean, it's it, it was a great region, and there's a lot of people who want to be involved. There just wasn't a lot going on in our region. I mean, we would go to High Folk, and High Folk just had 
everything in order, meta orgs, adventures. I mean, they could have kept pumping out adventures with the people they had, Jason Bowman, Chris Tulak, Greg Marks. Uh, I mean, they were just, you know, and they were great adventures. And, and I wanted to see some of that for our region. And uh, not that I really did that kind of level of writing, but I you know, wanted to run events, I wanted to be involved. And, you know, and it was kind of, you know, meeting people. I mean, I was not part of that community. I moved to Chicago, I'm originally from Detroit, I'm back in Detroit. So it was uh, a lot of getting involved with people, meeting people, and you know, eventually you kind of find out that you're within the system of getting events, producing events, writing events, talking to people to, to try and write, and then eventually I became triad. What uh, year was that when you became triad? Oh God, now you're gonna ask me questions with man. October <laughs> 2004. Well, there you go. October uh, he, 2004. So there was the historian. So the revolt took a couple of years. It did, um, but part of that was trying to get things going. So by year two, we were we were doing more events. Um, if I couldn't get an event for a convention, we'd ask permission to run an interactive. I would take six months, uh, develop an interactive, write one page, hand it to everybody. They asked me why I didn't finish it, and I would explain it over 30 minutes, and then hopefully it ran well. So Sometimes you just had to do that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I did off the cuff. Uh, you know, we did a Bethams bookstore with certain books that just gave you an in-game benefit. People went crazy for it. They were trading for books, and they asked me, how many did you make? And I made, I don't know, 60 individual books, three certs each. And hmm. you know, people cool. were like, why'd you do that? And so, and then just really kind of leaned into the, the meta orgs. I thought Mounted Borders was was neat because it, it's really only two lines. I think one was in the Greyhawk Atlas and the other one was in uh, the Greyhawk Wars supplement that mentioned that Verbobonk has these Mounted Borders that are traveling through the Crown Hills, near the Gnarly. Um, you know, to me that spoke of Lone Ranger stuff, you know, the, the soldier, the adventurer who's kind of patrolling on his own by his wits and what abilities he had. And, so I kind of wrote to that. So I know we'll get through a lot of questions and, and Vernon, welcome back as well. And, and mm-hmm. thank you. Um, I, I have a question that I need to answer uh, that Anna needs to answer because when we go, I, I just, I, I, before I forget, you're just talking about that development and all the maps empty everywhere else in the world with the exception of, the Verbabonk map, <laughs> where it's a freaking mess. I mean, look at. I mean, it's just so like it's like I don't know if I want to venture. There's too. There's so much stuff. All right. So, is this part of the sit that that town program that I read about Vernon and Michael? And that's it. So people are pu- making towns all over the place. Is that what happened? And for, for the well, audience, Anna took Living Greyhawk towns and put them on her map. Yes. Yes. Oh, most of you. them, not all of them. Well. <laughs> Instead of the points of light, you've got points of gas stations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I yeah, just, it it does it does look like an air traffic control diagram. It does, doesn't it? Um, yep. Not there's anything wrong. Yep. I'm just now busting. in to, in Anna's um, and you have to excuse so, me. I'm printing something in the background here. Um, in Anna's, to speak to Anna's map, she pulled from a lot of sources. There, there's a, I think there's a settings on there that were not part of Living Greyhawk, not, and certainly not towns that we created, like Woodstock. Uh, we didn't create Woodstock. Woodstock's a character in Peanuts. Um, so, but, there, but even with that said, we had 10 towns that were created in the Verbabonk Town Project. Um, so we, we did really flesh out that region with that particular um with that particular project and the rules for that were it was originally created as a contest uh where um you know players could create their own town and they could get resources and whoever ended up like with the town that had the most resources and the resources were randomly determined um so you got what you got and you could make trade deals and i believe it was um uh josh Josh um josh brown and carl huelt and Mm -hmm. who created those rules originally and then it and that really is one of the things that drew me into the region. Um, okay. I started playing uh, Living Greyhawk. I, I was there in year one, but there, like Michael said, there wasn't a lot of Verbabonk stuff to do. And I was living down in Springfield, Illinois at the time. 
and we didn't get the same we didn't have the same number of players that you had further north in the state so so i had to kind of catch as catch could on these things so when the town project came out that was a way for me to get more involved with more players in the region and that just kind of drew me in and i and i worked with terry donor and a number of other people and we created a town and then other people were creating towns Seneca valley um hummings End, twilight falls validia uh, a lot of those towns you see on there were a part of originally towns created by the town project and the and players then, put a lot of work in it too. Yes. i mean they really put a lot of work into it it wasn't just pick five people, call it a town. I mean, they were recruiting, there was backstories, there were, they, oh. they were extremely intricate things going on in our region in, in terms of role-playing online with it, uh, going to other regions and recruiting people to say, hey, come bring your character, move to our town. It, it was amazing. And note Sorry. that Sorry I have, no, it's good. And note I have this, I, it says draft on it, but here's the Verbalbox Town Project Administrator's Guide. So- yes. Um, that came about when, uh, well, I, I, in one of the earlier shots you had was the business opportunities document that I wrote. The administrator's guide sort of evolved as a way to kind of codify the things that we needed a town project administrator to do. Um, and, and in fact, my rewrite of the rules that we did in, in um, 2005 came about because I was looking for a way to expand options in the town project for people. Uh, I wanted them to be able to make money for their businesses. And in the course of that discussion, um, we found out that some players had were running like 80, 80 business uh, characters. I mean, they, they were practically business magnets. And it was just a quirk in the Living Greyhawk rules with the way cohorts worked and the way they advanced. Some players would get a cohort, chuck a, a bunch of craft and profession skills into that cohort, and then just sort of have them as a cohort CEO running everything. And, you know... You know, rules that would work fine for more modest players running a business or two really break when you when you throw in like, hey, I'm running 80 businesses. I'm I'm, I'm basically <laughs> OCP from RoboCop. Um, so nice wow. Detroit um, reference. Yeah, thank you. I'm I'm got to make oh, got to throw those in. So that awesome. um, that so in looking in looking through that, you know, it, you kind of determined that we really needed a systemic rewrite because rules that work great for a contest don't necessarily work for a sustained meta campaign initiative, um, which is what the town project really was. And so that's it, sort of how I dove into redesigning the rules for that and making them more resilient, if you will, for a, uh, you know, a, a 12,000 uh, player campaign. One of the other things, uh, just to real quickly, is sure. that uh, when we were sitting around talking about it, uh, the consensus was, is like, there's no way people are going to sink this much money. You know, we had different kind of tiers and things you could get if you built up your town. And we, we looked at each other and like, there's no way this is going to be like that big of a money sink. And we were completely wrong. Uh, I mean, in terms of what players were doing with their cash and at the time you could buy items, you could do other things. And people were sinking resources that other yeah. people were using to, to get game crunch and, you know, build characters that were powerful um, to build up their towns and, and really kind of put them on the map. And, and I, we were just completely wrong about that. Like, In third it, edition, it, you could upgrade your magic items. And the vast majority, I think, of Living Greyhawk gold by characters was spent on their magical armor, weapons, upgrading... Sure. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But if we go back to the early editions, at least as far back as AD and D first edition, ninth level, right? Lord got a castle yeah. or a keep, and the wizard got a tower, and you got followers, and you could do things with your followers in AD and D. Well, gold and, was also XP. Gold was also a way you could level. Right back then, the absolutely. Edition, yeah. And I don't think we had very many property opportunities outside of Verbabonk before word got out that this had gotten approved for you by the circle and then a whole bunch of regions, including the bandit kingdoms, we wanted to see the rules so that we could modify them. And then we ended up having property for sale in the bandit kingdoms in a different manner, but this helped right. lay the foundation for us to make that ask to the circle and say like, well, you approve this for verbal block. This is how we want to do it in the bandit kingdoms. And to me, property is what ties a character down so that they're not just a murder hobo. 
Right. Well, and that was one of the things I made sure to do when I did the rewrite of the town project rules. I think, I don't remember if you were on there at the time, Casey, but I put them on the triad discussion list because I wanted everyone to see what were we what we were doing, um, get their thoughts on it, and take it and, and run with them for their own reason. And Joe Selby, bless his heart, did that to, did that uh, whole cloth with uh, with the divers uh, ad adaptation of the rules. And Zeef did it, and I heard, yeah. know you guys did it, and that's well, exactly and what I wanted. I wanted us to feed off of each other right. um, as triads to build off of each other's ideas. And I suspect it went from Joe Selby to my friend Britt, who was good yep. friends with Joe, and then to me. And I have, I got triad in like in 2005. I wonder what – I could look that up if I really needed to figure oh, out. Oh, it's on 995 uh, if I needed plug. to know. But um, <laughs> damn, I surprised myself with that plug. <laughs> what was I saying? Uh, but – I suspect if it was in 2005 when I was a triad member, Vernon, I probably said some stupid things on the Living Greyhawk Yahoo groups triad list. We had a Yahoo groups where all the triad members and we would argue with each other and tell oh, the Sheldamar yeah. Valley, you guys are full of cheese. You know, <laughs> your certificates are out of control, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I, I do recall when we finally saw those in the Bandit Kingdoms, but I don't, I don't know if it was 2005, 2006, but... It was just well, a great addition to the campaign. I, I remember, I, I think, getting a an, a an email from Tim Sec that somebody complained about the, our, our town project rules. And I had to tell him, you know, the copy I've released was just a draft. They don't go into effect until much later. It's just a way for people to get used to them because the town. I was making the, the mayors of the towns reconvert their towns under the new rules because we had again we're verbabon we're, we're a relatively small place we had some towns that had like you know hundred thousand gold piece treasuries which was more than greyhawk city <laughs> i realized it's a campaign but it was also a bit ridiculous so one of the things i was trying to do was to rein that stuff in and i that's where i needed rob and michael as my bodyguards because there were some yeah, uh, there's some, there some, some people pushback. who were irate about that yeah because and there, you know it's, you had the town was filled with all heroes with all pcs that's why right that's yeah, the difference yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. then you break the theory of six bozos which yes. is yeah. every living greyhawk adventure isn't played by 30 different adventuring parties or 100 different adventuring parties there's one adventuring party that does that timeline, that multiversal, you know, fork in time, like from the Loki TV show or Doctor Strange or whatever, right? So we call yeah. that the theory of six bozos in the Bandit Kingdom. So you don't have a country full of adventurers. To, in my mind, you have a low-level party who survived and are doing well, a mid-level and a high level, depending on the size of the country. Right. Uh, well, and yeah, the yeah. law of six bozos is a good description for the verb about try it at various points. Too, so. <laughs> uh, well, I, I didn't want to go down. This is a great rabbit hole I went down because. Uh, yeah, it's, I, yeah, sorry about that. No, this is no, great. This is great because, have... like, here, you had to elect a mayor for every town. Yes. Very democratic. Yes. Well, you and you should see the Yahoo group uh, posts on those things. I mean, people campaigned pretty hard for that position. Yeah, I, yeah. Which so is, now, is the Robobank in the game a democracy, or was this oh, hell no. a modern thing you had to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it was just a recognition of, you know, give give players some choice in what was going on, that's all. Yeah, what okay. was the perks for having a character that wasn't mayor? What was the one? Oh, oh, any, per any perks that came with the position Public of Public executions. Being no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I think it was more just bragging rights uh -huh, to some yeah. degree, and, yep. and you kind of were the figurehead for your town. If, if yep. we ended up having an interactive or, I thought you or, could or anything that, that was involving for, that. Yeah, for all the bad things that happened. So to speak. Yeah. Um, not a lot of bad stuff happened. I, I had one player where I destroyed a, basically a restaurant who was very upset with me, and we wrote it into the adventure because we wanted to show some things were changing, that, that our region was going to war, and they got extremely upset with us, or, well, me. And, uh, you know, I like, but, uh, <laughs> well, I, we could talk offline. But, <laughs> it's, uh, sure. but you great. know, but... but but years later, it's like, yeah, you know, you shouldn't have been that upset about it. But it was actually, you know, a lot of this stuff was very emotional. They had time invested in it. It was very right. important to them. We we yeah. treated it in an important way. And, and you know, our, our region had a lot of tempers flare over things we decided to do, either with meta-orgs. But we, we tried to interweave 
every single project we have and every single meta org into the things that we were doing. There was but that, specific right. missions and adventures. There was specific things in the LARPs that you could achieve. I mean, I, I had two LARPs that I basically ripped off John Carpenter stuff that had opposing factions attempting to do things that were basically around assault on precinct 13. Yes! You know. You know. Sorry if I got so, hurt in people's ears. The original, right? <laughs> the original yes, assault. The original. Totally. I want chocolate Napoleon. ice cream. Uh, yeah. uh, let's not even go there. What a great movie yeah. that is. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Just wanna... Let's circle this back to the meta oh my and, and town. <laughs> yes, did it you, does. Did you assign oh. the meta like, give them base towns that didn't exist until the town project? That is awesome. Like, the, no, they, the they mountain were border. <laughs> Good. No, I was just going to say, did the mountain borderers have now garrisons in these towns and things like that that PCs would have home bases that was up to players to do and they could totally do that uh i mean we we kind of the way the meta orgs worked is that they they ended up having probably one set place and then as the towns grew up you know people would be like well we have a collection amount of borders now we have an outpost um you know we we had one where there was a temple to oldamara uh, and they really like were into money and finance, and so then they recruited some players who were playing Zilchus priests. Like, all right, open up a temple of that. So now we're a trading place, and you know that is it was completely player driven. And, and as those things popped up, and we recognized them, we would introduce them into some of the adventures. We definitely did them in terms of LARPs, uh, battle interactives, bringing those things in. Um, but it was a lot of player-driven stuff. It, it, it was only, I would say, if there was any success to that, it was probably because of the players and how much they loved it. Absolutely. Well, just from looking at the map, it looks like uh, they loved it. So, I mean, you know, just, so, just by taking a look at this. Not stuff. all of that is our pro is our fault, but... Most of... Uh, yeah. It's clean. my fault. Well, <laughs> well... Yeah, it's... Um, well, I, I can explain a little bit because... the. the for Bobok is a victim of a lot of circumstances, so to speak. That, yes. That kind of, first of all, it was the first, air, the yeah. oldest area on the map. Yeah, Hamlet. Wild yeah. Coast. And, and for Bobok, I did back in the 90s. I did, and, mm. and I just put stuff that I found on Cannon Fire and I found in the early product, uh, product so to speak. So several of these things are from articles that people wrote on the Cannon Fire, Cannon Fire forums. And then when I started putting the map online, I just put them there. I didn't, I, I didn't edit the map or censor it or, or go through it much in the sources. It was like some, oh, that's cool. I just add that to the map. That was it. I mean, there wasn't much thought about it. It was just supposed to be my campaign map and it ended up on the internet. That was back in the day when that area was, was done. I didn't know much about using the software or any of that stuff. It's early Here. days. And you're just, that Anna? It, sorry? You're that yes. Anna with the Greyhawk Yeah, she's that Anna. Oh my god, I love your stuff. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Oh, you, you didn't know that? Totally oh, over my yeah. head. Oh my gosh. Thank you, yeah. Thank you for your work. So, 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 yeah, so it's the day. Yeah, and then came the Living Greyhawk, <laughs> so, yeah, so to speak, that was uh, wah, it, it wah, introduced. Wah. And, and it started to... to so I, I started funny. putting that in as well. And so 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 for Bobok has the, the the dubious honor, so to speak, of being the, the test ground for, for it. And well, and it's just yeah, a testament to how many people better. love playing in in that area of the, yeah, of the that, world. That's the so. other thing. Mini has content from, from the yeah. earliest days, the Gord books, people's personal campaigns, LG, right. and it kind of gets crowded. And I kind of weeded out some of it over the years because it gets it, one didn't match the other and, and stuff like that. So I, I kind of, I've started to censor it a little bit on my campaign map. I've censored it even more. But right. on the public map, if I start removing things that has been on the map for 20 years, someone will say, oh, no, I've used it in my campaign. And I'll get, so, so yeah. So, <laughs> so I have to, now I have to be kind of careful not do too right. many changes. Well, and that's, that's kind of what I meant when I said we had a lot of eyes on our region because, it, yeah. it, I mean, the first adventure, Village of Hamlet, it's yep. quintessential. You can't, yep. You can't think of D and D without thinking of Verbabach or yeah, Greyhawk I mean, without thinking mm -hmm. of Verbabach. We just yeah, we just the tourist use Hamlet. And That's what I wanted exactly. exactly. So they were hands off. Yeah. Could, could they even? Oh, you, no one could even walk step foot in Hamlet. So no. so even in year one and year two, I I think that even after they did the return thing, we went back and asked, and we said, well, this is out. Can we use some of this? And they're like, no. Hands off. It was a special event at Gen Con in year one, I believe. It or... was actually Gen Con in Origins. It actually spanned both. Because SRM SRN ran my table for uh, Origins, oh, nice. that, that version of it. 
And uh, and yeah, they did do a special event, but we could never, ever in the the, the history of us having for Bobak ever touch it, write it, we can mention it, can't do anything with it. So, so Homlet, Nolb, the Moat House, and the Temple of Elemental Level were all out of bounds. Off limits. Absolutely. That's so Absolutely. sad in the Living of Mini. Everything that made Greyhawk great, so to speak, were not included in the Mini. Did they do things in core modules, or, or was it just skipped over completely? It was skipped we over think completely. that they were planning on it. Uh -huh. There was a Living Greyhawk Administrator's Handbook, yeah. and I've been talking in the Discord channel recently and with uh, Big Mac, I believe, about this. That that said, these are the areas of Greyhawk you cannot use without our RPGA permission. Yeah. Stoink was one of them because of the Gord books, presumably. Obviously, the Temple of Elemental Evil here, because they must have had plans, right, for special events. Uh, the one in year one, I think characters were first, second, or third level when they went into the Moat House. And so clearly they thought they would do more like a progression, the uh, Bright Desert, I think. May have just yeah. been core, but parts of it I think were off limits. You couldn't use Drow and Dragons and Monsters over CR 18 without permission until late in the campaign. Yeah. And kind of all the rules. Like and in the Bandit games, games, we couldn't use Stoink, but in year six or seven, we just said to hell with them when we started using it. <laughs> right. and, and any named NPC that was published uh, in, in any other book or what have you, you couldn't name. You could. You could mention a person, you could mention that this person was here doing something, but you could never use them per se. Ah, so, yeah, right. they were so no Rufus and Burn, no Canonish yep. Day, none of them. Yep. yep. Right. Wow. Now they really? did they did relax some of that a little bit later on when we started getting into Mater Regionals, which were groups of regions. Uh, some of the Mater Regional adventures uh, were able to touch on the the Temple of Elemental Evil. But I think only and in Hamlet, but I think only two did it, and both ironically were writ, were, were written by uh, Verbabank uh, members. Um, so it's, but but beyond that, we really couldn't do anything with it. So we so, so did this and, impact your meta work? About other things. Did this impact your meta works? Would Verbabank, you had free reign, have meta works that was solely purposed to fight the Temple of Elemental Evil from being repurposed repopulated or something or was that the, the borders i think i think part of the thing that at some point we decided and i think it was maybe year three year four and i, I wouldn't say we it was also lon it was also cheryl um that we had to nibble around the edges of that stuff and focus on some other things uh so it was the aftermath of having temple of elements of evil what what happens when that cult breaks up and kind of moves to the hills, moves to the forest, uh, what happens after the Greyhawk Wars uh, in terms of rebuilding some of that region. And so we we definitely mentioned some of those things. We definitely tried to say they exist. Here's some elements of that. You know, we, we weren't right. trying to write around it as a vacuum like that, like, well, it's off limits, we'll never talk about it. We just could not let you confront it head on you could front you could confront things that we labeled as elemental cultists you could fight things that were trying to bring the temple back yeah, but, um, mm. but you you couldn't Other really names. just go like yeah. right to the moat yeah. house and go like let's search there i think there's a sword under this rock that makes sense you know? yeah it makes sense you know and i and i was a greyhawk fan i i've grown up with it since you know uh it came out. I mean that, and then you know the the blue box known world are my two favorite kind of campaign settings. And when Forgotten Realms came out, I thought it was too, for my taste, spelled out. Um, whereas Greyhawk, to me, always was. Um, there is nobody that's going to come and correct the things that are going on. It's up to heroes stepping up versus having, let's say, the Harpers. They'll take care of it if you don't. You know. Uh, they'll make sure everything's fine. And so I, I really like the Greyhawk setting. That's partially the reason why I got more involved. Well, it's interesting to see, you know, how each one had had uh, their limitations. And we've heard GL's limitations. No drow, you know, it's like, no drow, you know, especially there. Um, but uh, it sounds like you guys so, had no issues with it. I mean, you know, you, you worked around that issue with, the, right. you know, by by saying that there, there was elemental evil in the area. Kind of the same way in my campaign. There's always been fa remnants, factions, someone trying to bring it back. But it's just not a named person, you know, uh, out, out of the out of the temple. It, make, it makes total sense. 
Real quick, so uh, I, I, um, giveaways. We had a level five hype train, so I'll do two of these. Two two choices. You got Paladin in Hell, Shady Dragon, and Abbas for all in reprints, obviously. Two of those, and I, I popped it up. Uh, yeah, one of the, I mean, you know. Uh, Paladin in Hell? Yeah, why not? It's a classic. A nice reprint there. And then also uh, two digitals for the Adventures backpack still, which I gave out three. I'm still waiting on the codes from Chuck, but he promised them to me tonight. So two more digitals, the Adventures backpack from Castles and Crusades, which is a nice uh, publication from them. So four tonight. Thank you for that level five hype train earlier. All right. Um, meta or the meta orgs. Uh, I'm just going to pop one up here. How's that sound? Because uh, uh, I'm going to 592. 591 is kind of empty. Whoops, I hit a wrong button. I hit a wrong button. You get to see Tim. <laughs> you get to see Tim ripping the tongue out. That's the Tim we were talking about earlier, Minza. Sorry. That was the wrong button. I swear to God, I hit the wrong button. I did not do, I did not do that on purpose. Mongrels of the putrid tongue. Yes. Oh my Mongrel, god. I feel a little hungry now. <laughs> yeah. yeah that, that was a that was absolutely a mistake. I did not mean to do that. I apologize, but it was a. a <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right. I don't even know where to begin in here. There's so many. So I'm just gonna go. Uh, what's it? Verbal Bunk Builder Book Acquisitions April O two. Is that is that give you a general uh. idea? That, that might have been a triad document on what things we could give out in MetaWorks at that time. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I was not triad at that point. So I, I, I was just the beneficiary of the MetaWorks that got that stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the circle, the uh, Living Greyhawk circle, which was the administrative body for the overall campaign, uh, gave rules to the triads on what, what benefits uh, MetaWorks at the time could um, give out. And these changed yearly. Uh, meta orgs in like year four and year five and later on look very different than they did originally when the campaign started in year two and year three, as you might have noticed, Jay. Um, and it's yeah, just, as, yeah. there, as, as more and more books became available and there was more and more power creep, uh, the circle did what it could to uh, manage the, the flow of those things and change the benefits that meta orgs could give players. So this is, this is an early uh, example of the kinds of things we could, we could give out at that time. I think we should take a quick second to define meta org. Exactly. Yeah, our audience yeah. members. Yeah, I don't good. think we've done that yet. Uh, a meta org was an organization in game that player characters and NPCs could be members of. That would be like a background now in fifth edition or a faction in Pathfinder Society mm -hmm. might be a better analog. And it would help root your character in the region. And some adventures would tie into the meta orgs as NPCs or plot points or MacGuffins or whatever. But every PC in Living Greyhawk had what's called time units. It was a terrible name for something, but yeah, you yeah. have 52 of them, and adventures cost time units to play. One, two, four, eight, whatever. And when you were out of time units for a year, that character could no longer do anything in Living Greyhawk, and they reset every year on January 1st. So meta orgs could trade time units you could spend your time units and gain benefits by joining them membership and here you could see you get an influence point or you gain access to spells or you could get gold 1250 gold pieces and was three that time like units, a you know? time investment for a character that you said that instead of doing an adventure time unit, that's a good way could, to put it you could be like part of a meta organization as a or, or was you, it you, it was you both. would be actually doing service. Uh -huh. So whenever you were spending those time units um, to do that, you were on patrol. So if you were a mounted border, you were patrolling during that time. You were looking for trouble. You were making sure the mm -hmm. place was safe. If you were in a temple, you were doing temple service. Um, and in doing those things, if you spent enough time and or money or influence, you could gain access to spells feats or other things that you wouldn't normally be able to have that okay. we would consider yeah. we would call restricted or okay. you know like or in, in card speak you know there's common uncommon rare right. yeah. you could spend enough stuff to kind of get into the uncommon and rare abilities or, or things that you'd want yeah. i mean especially prestige classes too we had a lot of that yeah cool so uh, from this, I note some uh, some interesting ones for for uh, this year. Let's just go here. The mounted borders. All right. So um, it looks like these are just hey, baby. Oh yeah, the shores. No, I I wrote it. it was, awesome. You know, the first Talk about it, please. Talk about it. 
Uh, I, so we were talking about developing backstory, meta orgs. There was competing, uh, the, like the gnarly forest uh, encompasses a couple of regions. And, uh, and so there was some back and forth about who should do this, what should it look like? I was asked to write a meta org. Uh, I had, I would call significant Greyhawk knowledge. And one of the things they latched on in my teens was basically the mounted borderers. And I always liked the concept of, I mentioned earlier, the Lone Ranger um, person on horseback has everything, all their possessions, and they're just kind of circling the border of Verbobank, the Cron Hills, uh, making sure that uh, uh, evil out of the gnarly doesn't spill into the community. And... Uh, I sat down, I had never written anything fantasy uh, related, and I ended up pouring out like, uh, I don't know, 10 pages initially, and I think they boiled that down a little bit, but yeah, that's all me. There's, it's all based on two sentences. Okay. So it's one of the few things I could take full credit for. The, I love this. The Mountain Borders are one of the elite fighting groups at the Battle of Emerity Meadows. That's where I started my campaign when I was 12 years old at. So there you it's go. A, and it's a huge event and it does carry on through a number of like the historical mm -hmm. books or supplements that talk about uh, the area and the Greyhawk Wars. And, and I really latched onto that and kind of just extrapolated that if they are protecting and they are who they are, they would band together and, uh, and be basically called special forces uh, to fight that battle. Very cool. Uh, so the biggest challenge they face is recruitment. So how many members? How many uh, um, members were part of the Mountain Borderers uh, player characters? Do, do you, if you recall, uh, at some point, and I'm I'm guessing, and it's also been you know over what 12, 14 years. Sure. Uh, I I believe it had up to almost four hundred members. Nice. Wow. Other regions and our region, and you wouldn't um, even know there would be people playing at home. Who never participated in the right, convention group, right. who probably never emailed a triad member or participated on the Yahoo groups, and they were just perfectly happy waiting for the next mods to come out. And you could do all this meta org stuff without ever emailing uh, Menza or Vernon or myself in the BK. There were documents online that you would print up the certificates, the adventure records, things like that, and your character would just simply be a member of this org. You didn't have to ask anyone's permission. But you could take part in the wider Living Greyhawk universe through various in-character message boards that a lot of regions had. And I suspect you guys had a very active one. Yeah. One we question. did. Sorry. One question going there. What, what was this? The adventures for Living Greyhawk, were they, could you run them at your home game if you announced it? Or was it only conventions or game stores? Or what was the, the kind of, the where could you run these adventures, so to speak? Um... Well, if Vernon won't answer, uh, initially you had to order them as events and, and they were at yeah. conventions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they slowly kind of made it where... Uh, like a month region, later. Yeah, the regional ones we would hold on to for like a couple conventions locally to help support them. Yeah. And then at some point we would release them so you could kind of get them off of uh, Watsi's site for the Living Greyhawk campaign. Mm -hmm. So there was a little time involved. And could then you, you could could all these them. run officially so you could level up a character even if you run it later, so to speak? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, all the yeah. leveling have occurred on the adventure records or... Yeah. Uh, adventure search if you before the adventure record system came into place yeah and, and so my recollection is adventures would drop at cons and then a month later they would become officially available for what we called game days yes at comic book stores game stores could then have it run because everything got reported to the rpga theoretically in practice probably not and then a month later people could order them for play at home. So you would tell the RPG, my name is Dungeon Master so-and-so. I am ordering this Verbal Bonk adventure because I live in Illinois or Indiana and I plan on running it, you know, at my home or whatever. And here's my RPGA number. But once you had run that adventure once, you had a copy of it, digital or hard copy of it that you had gained at a convention and you could just run it whenever you wanted to. Well, what, the other thing to consider and it, when people hear Living Greyhawk and it's great and what have you, um, is that you could only play regional adventures in the state that they were produced. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
except for special events at say Gen Con or Origins where they basically have like a midnight madness and you could get, if you could find somebody from that region who had that adventure, you could play it there. But otherwise you had to travel to, for, for Bullock, you had to be in Illinois or Indiana state borders in order to right. play that. Yeah. Or with And Anakin, you would get you expelled from Texas. the RPG if you were caught violating that. That actually happened. I, I, I know, I reported a couple of people. So. <laughs> that's it, another offline thing in character you have these adventure records and as a dungeon master you're supposed to look if someone pulled out a plus three sword which would have been incredibly rare in living Greyhawk before the later years you might be like well where'd you get that oh I played this Joff adventure I'm just gonna throw Sheldamar Valley under the bus again you've got this plus oh, three yeah. intelligence sword and You'd be like, where'd you get that? Oh, well, I got it in Joff. Well, okay, well, let me see the adventure record. And the adventure record is signed and dated by the dungeon master who ran that table. And it might have a date, and you'd be like, wait a second, I saw that you were in Houston that weekend. There's no way you could have been in Virginia, the East Coast, or whatever. And those people, we had to expel some from the RPGA for cheating. Looking back on it now, the regional system was both a brilliant idea and a big hindrance. Yes. I, I had somebody in a convention when I asked them to produce the documentation for something they have, go to their car, get in their car, and drive away and leave. Mm. <laughs> like, just so they couldn't be called on or kicked out of right. playing Living Greyhawk simply because they had an item they weren't supposed to have. And just leave, not come back to the convention. And and so, part of the goal on this wasn't we weren't we weren't being policemen trying to find people making mistakes here. It's just some of the stuff came up in the course of play where you're right. trying to run a fair adventure, you're trying to everybody's trying to have fun, and somebody shows up with this broken loot that's breaking everything, and you're like, how how did you get some of this stuff? And you just want to see something that kind of corroborates what they're saying. You know, what we do you mean you have the hand and eye effect? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you see I that? Just, I just played an intro mod. Yeah. They were giving them out. Yeah. So I mean that we weren't we weren't trying to be jerks about the whole thing. We were just trying to make sure and that's I one was. of the things we did is try well <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't, but that's me. <laughs> but back in the day you, you had to do that stuff, you know. Yes, yes yeah. you did. Yeah. Because you just didn't. Was, I mean they had just, learned from Living City. Yeah. Living City had used physical cert. Yeah. And so, after adventures, they would hand out a cert which said longsword plus one or yeah. masterwork arrows or whatever. And eventually, Living Greyhawk got away from that, and it all became on a tracking. Well, it was a lot of printing for convention organizers. Oh, yeah. you're, you're expected to print all these certs, yeah. cut them, give them out. And I like certs. I'm not arguing against it. I love certs. If I ever started an organized campaign, I'd go right back to certs. But uh, it was, you know, it was wheeled. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could you, if you hoarded gold or, or, or like money, could you simply purchase something for your character from, from that hoard of money and then put that on your character sheet too? Was that another option of, of getting cool stuff? Or, or it, it was eventually. At some uh -huh. point they didn't. They, initially they didn't. It's basically when they were doing treasure, I think for years one and two, it might even be three, You would there would be like a plus one sword and then like a hundred gold pieces. And so basically everybody... Like four players would get 50 gold pieces and then somebody would get the plus one sword. And I think right. that's the thing they were trying to get away from is that wow, people okay. were leaving the table with like something great and then the, everybody else was not getting something great. And the adventure record basically said that you got a share and using that share, you could get that item. I mean, you're, oh, you're okay. purchasing it on paper, but really in the end, it's kind of trading what you have gotten for treasure for an actual item. And they were, they were trying to make it, much more equitable. I think they did. You know, yeah. it, it definitely worked. And I mean, Paizo uses it till this day. I, well, yeah, I think they, they Pathfinder use, Society. Uh, exactly. They yeah. use, yes. but, but there, there is like a purchasing round. You could, you could, if you're in a place where you can adventure stay, mm -hmm. you can purchase, you can spend money you have, I think, and, and get stuff that, that will be, and, yeah. And so we have this like 10 these, years up since I played it. So almost like. And these meta orgs, you could go and buy. I bet uh, the borderers today say like you could buy a, a really awesome war horse or or magic yeah. spears or whatever like what kind of access you know that would make sense yeah i think uh i think when i my character joined the borders my paladin in a year or two one of the things the borders got was this beefed up a light war horse uh that was one of the things that attracted me to it michael so uh well, there, I, was, I, there was, was yeah there was actually two horses it was uh, a, a coarser 
and I should know this. There was basically two, but uh, you could, they were a better version of each for all intents and purposes. Destrier uh, was uh, the other one. Destrier, thank you. Yeah. Because in third edition, a max hit point force would really go a long way towards surviving the first fireball that yeah. your character <laughs> eats, you know, when charging up a hill or something. Um, so that was a benefit I think we did in the Bandit Kingdoms. The Joe Rays mercenaries were known for their horsemanship and horse trading before I used smashed them. So in their meta org, I'm pretty sure I gave access to a max hit point or horse. Sure. Right. And why not? Because in the end, it, the, the horse is probably not going to survive. But I watched people make sure that horse got away, slap it on the keisters, like, you know, <laughs> have it off the battlefield. I'm telling you. Yep. I've, I've seen the weirdest stuff. We gave away a baby in an adventure. <laughs> and and I'll tell you what, that baby suck was a, a money suck. A money suck. <laughs> I remember that. I'd forgotten about it. They were, wow. they were. I had. I had questions. Can I put the baby in full plate? Uh, can I give all my my buffs to the baby instead of the party? It was amazing. I loved it. Right. Yeah. People carrying the baby in backpacks, like there was Yoda on their back, just carrying it everywhere. Okay, my... I'd forgotten about that baby until just now. Oh, I don't. I still think about that baby when I want to chuckle. <laughs> So, do you have any of the? the uh, did you guys send Jay any of your medical? Oh, I, I, have I have everything. Yeah, I have everything. I gave him the keys to the kingdom. But, but, but right. to the audience out there, I have nothing like Sergeant Schultz. I know nothing. I see nothing. I have nothing. <laughs> okay. So note the following: this stuff. It's not. A, it's up. To, if 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 you want to, uh, I know Michael already passed the buck. I saw it in chat. If you want to contact Vernon and ask for Meta Org docs, maybe they're not, you know, unlike unlike uh, ventures, you can ask Vernon uh, if he's kind enough to give them. I mean, I, I uh, Casey, I think uh, Meta Orgs can be given out, right? I mean, I think so too. Yeah, I think we should do a short discussion of the copyright issue, just real briefly. Right. This material was all fan created under the watch of the RPGA, but the RPGA did not edit this, right? No one above the Verbabonk triad sat here and edited this character Farlangen, which otherwise they would never have gotten anything done. So this is all fan content. Some of it is probably plagiarizing. I'm not saying this specifically, but I'm saying Living right. Greyhawk. Are you saying? Content. I plagiarized, I used the evil <laughs> from time to time when I was doing sure. panicking stuff because I needed to copy and paste to save myself some time. So Copyright issues, I believe the meta org stuff, the meta org documents are fair game. They were freely downloadable to anyone in those regions and they can be shared, no problem. When it comes to the adventures, Wizards of the Coast owns various adventures and I, I don't want to get into that right now. And the I think authors, they, they, they only own the first two years. If you got well, paid... Well, if you got paid as a regional author in years one and two, or you were a core author, because all core mods were paid for. Those are actually owned by Wizards of the Coast. They're under copyright. You cannot distribute the PDFs without violating their copyright. That's why I will always shut down that discussion on the Discords and the Facebooks, sure. et cetera, et cetera. For all other adventures, the authors were not paid. They were not works for hire. Therefore, the authors still retain the copyright, the non-Wizards of the Coast intellectual property. So the story, the plots, the idea, the descriptions, new towns, whatever. So we have an issue where authors are using Wizards of the Coast intellectual property, but it's not as a work for hire. So legally, I do think there's an argument that Wizards of the Coast lost control of Greyhawk IP. But until someone's willing to go That's, to court within right. that, we won't know. Now, Britt Frey was my roommate. He's a Circle member. He has a law degree. He and I spent a lot of time talking about this very subject. And as you can imagine, it was something we really needed to know before I published this. Awesome. Second plug. <laughs> <laughs> this one was a little bit more academic. Though. Yes, yes. Uh, right. So, so the, the short yeah. answer is you can't publicly share the adventures because there's various copyright issues going on. But I agree that the meta org stuff, I think we should eventually build an online museum to it and curate it and clean it up. I mean, I'm looking through, there's triad and circle documents from year one, which are just fascinating. And I share those with people because I know that's not a big deal. But the adventures, no. So, and I've published some of my adventures by converting them to Pathfinder and stripping out the Greyhawk IP. 
that's just another approach. So Uzel, Uzel wants to know about um, uh, Sign of the Black Orchid. Sign of the Black Orchid. I saw that. Well, it, it's a hard one to talk about because it, it went through a lot of writing and a lot of process you, changes. Uh, I mean, Darren Spurrier was uh, one of the first people to start writing on it. Yes. Uh, and then Rob Sylvan Vernon <clears throat> kind of came in and added the overarching meta plot that was going on. And so it, it's, you know, and then I had my hand in it too. So it's, it's, it, it's a, a Frankenstein that turned out, I think, really, really well. I think it's one of the best adventures our region did. Um, and it's definitely not because of anything I did. Um, but the, the work Rob Silva did, Vernon did, and Darren Spurrier, like it, it's, uh, it's one of the better things to play. That Black Orchid is one of my favorite, if not if not my favorite, uh, adventures that we wrote during my time as Triad because it was one of the first where we absolutely had no combat whatsoever. Everything had a non-combat resolution uh, to it. And in fact, we had some people who were upset because they were taking their their uh, <laughs> their warrior characters on there. They wanted to fight, and it was we had we had um, made some announcements when we started the year six campaign. We were going to have non-combat resolutions for things. Uh, I remember saying on various documents, the zoo is closed um, because we had just had a whole bunch of cracked out monsters uh, come out for our year five end, and we needed to kind of reset things. And so Black Orchid and was a good example of us trying a new approach with not having fights, being able to, you know, it's, it was what you did, not how much damage you could deal. And I, I loved, I loved that for it. Go on, I think the other thing is that like uh, Rob was big on saying your your choices will affect yes. our region yes. and your choices will have consequences. Yes. And and that was the one thing that we constantly heard for years. One, two, three, some of four was uh, we're doing things that we don't feel like they matter. Well, your triad, you know, an adventure is an adventure. You play it. You, you know, there, there are some things you're already designing from a standpoint of story whether you succeed or not, that's great, but things are kind of going to go in a direction. We actually decided to start writing some things that we're going to decide the next year you know, yes. or decide what was going to go forward. And Sign of Black Orchid, if anybody's seen the movie Seven with Brad Pitt, mm -hmm. Sign of Black Orchid almost ends in a way that that movie ends. What's in the box? <laughs> Effectively. I mean, not, it's not the same. It's definitely not the same, but it's that you you gear up to things and and there is a twist and it's agonizing and I I ran it and watched tables agonize and get up and walk away and argue right. with each other. Nice. You know. Well, uh, and so it's, I, I remember uh, I remember Rob uh, talking with me about it because there at the, in the end of the adventure there was the potential where you're fighting you could get into a fight with some leaders from the Elven clans um, of the gnarly forest, which I got one. Um, and up right and now. it was a it was a really tense it. discussion. And Rob was having difficulty figuring out how to scale the encounter because the character was a general. And for the lower level characters, it would make no sense for them to be fighting a general and have an elven general and potentially win. He would just mop the floor with them. And Rob was having trouble balancing it. And I remember we, we talked about it and that's where we came to the decision, don't have them fight. He, it's not going to be a fight. And that's where that's where some people got angry about it. I mean, if he would mop the floor with them, present them with an ultimatum, they have to deal with the consequences of their choices in that they don't get to fight him. And it, it proved to be a very good choice uh, that we made on that because it, it made that adventure ending memorable. So um, I know someone has to go into detail on it, but I think that that's that you really tid you really put out enough tidbits there that maybe you don't want to ruin it for someone someday. Who no, may oh, play yeah, in sorry. It. You know, yeah, yeah. So uh, very cool. Yeah, spoilers. <laughs> so. Uh, we'll be bouncing back and forth between questions. This, who made the Wrinkle Academy of Magic? Ooh. This is pretty cool. I don't remember. I, if I had to take a guess and if Josh somebody Brown? could easily, I was going to say it was, it was either Josh, Carl, uh, 
maybe Mark Fisher, maybe. I mean, I, I thought it. Yeah. I thought it was within that. It, one of the things to consider about like our region is that uh, even though we encompass two states, and and for better or worse, a lot of it was based in Chicago, and Vernon knows that. I mean, because right. Southern Illinois did not get a lot of love until you, Carrie, Chad, kind of you know started to get really involved, and. Be, in Chicago, when I initially got there, there was a lot of uh, communities, smaller communities based around game stores, based around people who went to college together. And so uh, a lot of these meta orgs kind of went into groups' hands that uh, kind of could handle it and they designed together. So there was Josh Brown, okay. uh, Carl, um, Dave Bowder. Dave Bowder did a lot of stuff with... Yes. Uh, you know, for meta orgs. Um, then there was, you know, people a little more in the city. Uh, Joshua kind of rose comes to mind. Um, you know, so there's a lot of people writing stuff, but they were within their own small tribalism or tribe. And then it's only eventually as people kind of got together, it became a bigger community. I mean, and that's the thing is that as much as all these players have been playing for a long, long time, it, it took Living Greyhawk to bring kind of everybody together, even if it was for a short couple of years to kind of sit down, design, talk things over and kind of make things make sense. I think that's why we got a lot of really good writing out of the meta orgs because a lot of that was farmed out to people like me had very little uh, writing experience, wanted to write, had some good ideas and, and a lot of it came out. It's really good. Uh, and I, I see there's, it goes on in further uh, months. So uh, years. Um, on things like the wrinkle Academy are also an example of, you know, Verba Bond not being a terribly large town, may not have, would not probably canonize have an Academy of Magic, but it's just, it's one of those constructs that you have to accept so that you can have a campaign where, where, where adventures work and players feel like there's options for them to, uh, to participate in, as Anna was mentioning earlier. I also love that you have all four El Sylvanoff clans that are mentioned in From the Ashes in here. They're all yours? That's me. That's because I use them a lot, and I'm uh, I'm glad to see that they're here. Very, very. I, cool. I like the idea that when when they were written up, I like the idea that they they worked together, but they also competed against each other. Mm -hmm. That they were each an individual power structure, um, not just lumped up as we're elves and we live in a forest. Yep. Uh, and and I think I also got a lot of that from playing in High Folk and seeing how, um, you know, they were tackling elves elves were a, a much more complicated social structure the way they presented it uh that there was infighting between you know uh families and elves so i, I definitely love this stuff about the gnarly um but i have to kind of give credit to the guys up in in milwaukee wisconsin uh for kind of showing me the path to kind of tackle that yeah, uh, it is a really cool um, thing, and I'm glad you did it because uh, one thing, you know, we we had that worthy? we did we, well we did in depth last last week we discussed the from the ashes we went through it and just went almost every page through it and um, this uh, the Darley Forest area with the Rangers and the Swan Maze and all the clans. In that area, I'm glad to see that Ver you had that area, the Ver of Verberbach. That was part of your area too. Was it just the western Norley, or did you run all the way across to the border of Greyhawk, or was it just the west? I think the only person we ever really dealt with was Joe, because Joe and Divers had control of the Gnarly on that side of uh, on the east, and and I think there was a, just an agreement between our regions that this is kind of how we were going to tackle it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and Joe was great about everything early on and throughout the entire campaign. And, uh, and I think once we kind of passed some of the information that we were using and, and Lon Ladiman was working as the kind of middle man, he was the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the triad at the time when a lot of the stuff was starting to come out, uh, he was able to kind of get everybody on the same page with it. So I think that's why it worked. Yeah. Um, not just the writing, but also that everybody kind of said, well, this kind of works for the gnarly. And, and I think Joe might have had something similar or they might have just pointed to ours. So you'd have I, to ask Joe. I know that when uh, I was tried and Joe and I were really talking back and forth, we tried to 
I, I don't want to say coordinate, but certainly make sure that we were on the same page with what our elven, various elven clans were doing, uh, with what they were doing in their region, what we were doing in ours. And the elven clans became a really important part of our core six to eight plot line with, uh, with what we did with uh, Lord Esteval and uh, his, uh, his influence in our region. And so we, it, Divers was doing some things with the Blackthorn Orcs and uh, the elven clans were involved. So they were that. reaching deep into the gnarly. They were reaching deep yeah. into the gnarly, exactly. And so one, one, the one thing I regret about the ending of the camp, Living Greyhawk campaign was that I didn't have the opportunity to do um, what we wanted to do with Twilight Falls and the Elven Clans because there was going to be a major event oh. involving them. Okay. Um, and uh, unfortunately, due to the expedited nature of the ending of the campaign, some, yeah. some plot lines had to get jettisoned in order to make sure we could resolve things satisfactorily. So... But, if um, so if you look here, Twilight Falls, and you have Ellen the Full, Feel the Full, Melderin, and Sharendil all yeah. on this map here. So you yeah. have, you know, in that area, uh, and you can see that Verbalbox is pretty far away from that. So that's good to see. But you guys right. almost went, almost went toward Norwell. You know, did you use Oak Vein? Did you use any of the Coristaith or, or 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 go deeper no. in? Okay, okay. So no, it, was just, part, it was just the Sylvan Elf realm. Yes. Yeah, part, okay. part of it was okay. part of it was gnarly was considered not off limits, but don't do a whole lot with it. And and they did more with it with the uh, meta regionals. Yes. So like mm. for our region, the gnarly and the river were basically the, the focus for our meta regional adventures. Right. Um, but uh, other than that, no, we didn't okay. use too many of the towns except for maybe passing through using it okay. as an adventure point. Right. All right. So for the I, audience. I, Meta meta regional adventure. Yep. Oh, go sorry, Vernon. No, no, no. Uh, finish no, your Please, thought on Casey, it. go ahead. So so make Mike there talk. were regional adventures as as we've described. This is Verbabonk, but Verbabonk was part of the meta region, which consisted of I don't have it from memory. I know you guys do, but I got a cheat sheet here. The uh, uh, BTF meta region, two flick files and Velver Diva. We had Valuna, Verbabonk, Divers, um, Cat, Tuzmet, and one other. Ekbeer. Wow. Ekbeer, thank Zyber. you. So it was kind of, it was kind of looked like this, kind of like a V almost. Yeah, we put the V in VTF. Yeah. Were, were in they wow. Just, <laughs> were they in your meta region because they were geographically located in in the real world, so to speak? Or I, I think they, they were in our meta region they, because they every other uh, Greyhawk. We, I think they were in our major region because we were just the regions that were left after they made all the. <laughs> oh, others, okay. So. It was the left no region. high folk. That's weird. Well, was High the, Folk was, was the meta river river. in the Ayus, the, oh, okay. the oh, Ayus right. meta region with us in the Band of Kingdoms. So Divers was Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska. Ekbeer was France. That was <laughs> some part yeah. of Canada. Postman yeah. was Quebec. Valuna was Ohio. Verbabonk, as we know, was Illinois and Indiana. And Zeif was a, the other part of Canada. Right. Uh, I forget if it was East or West because I just don't know Canadian geography. Everything but France touches. So kind of. meta orgs meta or meta regional adventures would be an adventure where theoretically you would have plot hooks for members from all regions and it would be a bigger story, something that was happening to multiple regions and you might travel during the adventure from one region to the other. Uh, but they were kind of a step between the regional adventures and the core adventures. And right. one of the things about Living Greyhawk that didn't make a lick of sense was that your character could be in verbal bonk one day and then you'd be in the free city of Greyhawk the next day, and then you'd be in the bright sands desert or on the moon or wherever on Selene or Luna the next day it's if it's you were doing a whole bunch of adventures. That's just the way adventuring and living Greyhawk well, works. Most DMs, well, 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 most DMs well, a do time unit was a week. A time yeah. unit was a week. Well, so. officially they weren't a week, but we all treated them that way because right. they were 52 hours. Sure. But still, like when I look at my adventure records for my characters, I'm like, this makes no sense. I went from the Yeomanry to the Free City of Greyhawk, back oh, to the Yeomanry, yeah. to the Band of Kingdoms. You know, it just... But it's that's like just a bad the way TV it show. It's, it's like a bad editing in a TV series. Right, you, you would have to just ignore it's that. Right. So Meta Regional yeah. Adventures okay. were a wider story being right. told. Yeah. And before right, anyone right. asks, uh, we did not have Meta Regional Meta Orgs, except maybe in a few places, just because most, most triads had their hands full managing their own region without coming right. up with meta orgs for six six regions uh, spanning half the world with languages you didn't speak. 
Well, and I've said this before <laughs> in previous shows. I think that was a failure of the campaign early administrators that they should have right. started with global meta yes. orgs. They should have started with the Church of Zilchis in the free city of Greyhawk. And where does its tendrils go? <laughs> right. And then the old faith should have been a flan wide meta org yeah. that drew it from skills. any region. Yeah, the, the yeah. Right. of the heart and, and it, stuff like and that. And then it should have been the, big, the, heart, yes. the Church of Aelor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you drill down and say, okay, well, in the Bandy Kingdoms, there's no Church of Palor, but, you know, we have this sect of Dimray over here, which worships this version of Foltis. So that can be its own version of the Foltis meta org, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Sure. So that, that was a failure of the campaign, but we did try to do meta regional meta orgs uh, by coordinating with divers in the Bandy Kingdoms, who mm-hmm. wasn't even in our meta region, but we decided yeah. to have uh, like gladiator type combat meta orgs. Um, and so we just kind of cloned each other a little bit there. All right, ready? Mike, say something. Hey, guys. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mike. <laughs> Come on, Mike, you got to have a meta org question. No, no meta org question. Sorry. <laughs> Oh I'm man! Sorry, but I would like to hear of, more about the kind of cow lady. lady. Yeah, the cow. There you go, the cow lady. What's well, I mean, so we were trying to come up with uh, things that players would respond to with possibly fear, possibly hate. I, I you know, about year three, year four, um, you know, we were hoping that people would end up starting to kind of really, uh, in my mind, get angry at the bad guys instead of kind of hand-waving them, like, well, we beat them, they won, who cares? And so uh, part of that was just trying to develop um, a villain NPC that uh, would kind of drive that, you know, make, make, make people make emotional choices, not, uh, in, you know, game choices, you know, well, I don't think there's event, much adventure going here, so we won't do that. And well, if we make a deal with them, maybe we'll get something better. And, and so as we started to kind of come up with, uh, the villains of our region, Cold Lady, Shannis, Shannis was a, a <laughs> big reveal later on, but Janice. early on was oh, a nice. friend to everybody, handing out rings to people and, um, you know, we wanted to kind of give them a little more footing in the world. So, right back at, at, for the uh, first five years of the Verba Bond campaign arc, um, which was what the original triads who started the region were required to do: submit a five-year, a, a basically a plot line covering the first five years of the game, because I guess that's how long they figured Living Greyhawk would last. And so we had a lot of things going on in our region. We had, we had the gnomes who were mad at uh, the old Viscount, Viscount Fenward, for what he did. And we, had, uh, we, and we had a lot of destabilizing forces going on in the region. And so we had three main villains, the first of which uh, will be a familiar to people. Abmi, the Hammer of Ayus, was sent to our region oh, to destabilize Oh, that's not Casey. Um, nice. Yeah, we, we had him running around. Uh, I, I, I had so many players pissed off at me because I think in one one box text that I wrote, I had him taking like nine an- actions and I never ha- heard the end of it. Um, but I didn't care. Um, oh, you were that kind of off. I, I, it's a, oh, <laughs> I would have flipped the I, I, table and stormed out of there. This is bullshit. I, I, yeah, th- th- that was uh, that was in that was when I was kind of still relatively finding my writing chops because ask me about the the first dwarven adventure I wrote where I had an entire page of box text because I just wrote a lot. Um, but anyway, we had Abmi the Hammer of Ayus who who uh, ended up assassinating one of our nobles and setting a bunch of other events in motion. Nice. We had um, uh, the cowled lady uh, who was the one. Uh, <laughs> destabilizing getting the giants uh involved and they were primarily attacking the gnomes and of course because the 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 viscounty had abandoned the gnomes through viscount Ven, venward they were sort of left to their own devices and basically struggling and being ambushed and the giants were creating a lot of unrest and that was at the behest of the cowled lady and then we had the third uh, villain who ended up was masquerading as one of our nobles um, the uh, villain's name was Rigenus, which was a wholly manufactured villain for our region, but he was masquerading as Lord Milanus, uh, who was a, a noble in our region that people loved to hate because he was an a-hole. Um, yeah. And 
she, uh, as part of that backstory, as you might see from the living Greyhawk Gazetteer, um, um, Lord Milanus and Lady Asbury, another one of our nobles, were engaged to be married, and then he went off to fight the Greyhawk Wars and came back a changed man, literally in this case. Um, <laughs> and so their union fell apart, um, and that there, that created a lot of tension between those nobles, but. Yes, we had we had three main villains in our region. The cowed lady ended up being one of the most powerful of them. Uh, the the uh, in fact we they finally get to engage with her or a proxy of her because um, my memory is kind of faded after sixteen years. Uh, in one of the adventures that uh, I think Michael wrote uh, in the Viscount Secret Service, um, no. the, the, <laughs> this mod was responsible for some very hostile words between myself and. Uh, and Carrie Suter, if you remember him, Michael. Yeah, um, I yeah. I, I, I the, the play the playtest table was not a fan of some of the uh, the choices that we made. Um, but uh, that's that's that that's as may be. It was an adventure fitting for tenth to fourteenth level characters, uh, and that's when you're playing at that, that level. That was eight hours your, long. Yeah, you got to bring your triple A game. So, but yes, that that's a short summation of what what those villains were in our uh, in our campaign. So I. There might have been a point I was making, and of course I talked so long I forgot what it was, but that was it. It's okay. See, <clears throat> when you talk, Anna, Mike, and I don't have to. When I talk, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. It's okay. So, yeah, but uh, uh, that's uh, great. Uh, yeah, I want to have a, a follow-up question to that, meaning now we've heard some of the NPCs, uh, villains. What yeah. about monstrous villains? Meaning they draw what out of the questions, and they might not be that kind of common in this area, but also dragons are the questions. So what were the master, the kind of the we, major monsters you used? You know, That's when a good I, question. Yeah, go on, Michael. No, I was just going to say, I think really early on, I, I, when I ended up getting involved, there was a talk about... Uh, what would villains entail? And I think like in year one, year two, I think it was more year two, uh, that we weren't going to use monstrous villains. We were actually, the, the region was going to be much more about the human, humanoid races. It's one um, of the quiet, cute, good little corners in the Flannies, so, so from, from first perspective, except for Temple of Elemental Evil. That's all we well, know. And that's why we kind of tapped that because we really yeah. thought that the that any evil that's kind of spread out and is taking root or manipulating things in our region was probably going to have a face of a neighbor. Um, they were going to work in secret. They were going to yeah. uh, work behind the scenes to some degree. We definitely had monsters in our region. We definitely had things like that, but they were more tools of the humanoids or elves or evil dwarves or what have you that were attempting to make things happen than just straight up throw a dragon on there. Not that we cared yeah. much anyways, but right. But it was it was a conscious choice to not use uh named NBC villains that were uh not humanoid. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now with that said, we had our share of cracked out monstrous uh things in our in our region. Um you would see them on our interactives mostly, but yeah we we didn't shy away from that uh, during that time. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the Dwarven Battle Interactives for the battle of, for the reclamation of Rock Hall. Uh, we just we just winged, un, I mean when, when I said this yeah when I when I said the zoo was empty. Did I hear winged the, the, the uh, yeah yeah you heard winged Ettons. Uh when when I made the phrase the zoo is empty, uh, you got to think of what the existence of the zoo implies, and I mean it was a menagerie. I love that phrase. I'm gonna yeah. steal that one, Vernon. Bill, Tim, did you hear that? I know you're both on still. Winged Ettons. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, a lot of the monster building. Um, nice. I'm. I'm not really. I was never really great with monster building. I liked. I liked things that were creative. I liked. Uh, I like natural things, man versus nature, that kind of stuff. And so a lot of the monster building was done by Rob Silva and Mike yes. Lundin, and they would go through and do the Great CR math and find the most yeah. atrocious stuff to build um, <laughs> using templates and using creatures that were not CR'd correctly. So usually Ettons, trolls, things like that, I, that once I'm you dead. put a template on, it was broke. Yeah. And, and there was a good reason why, well, a bad reason why we had to do this in various regions. By year three and four, people had memorized the monster manual 
And yeah. even though D and D became three point five, some of the monsters got new abilities. Dragons became tougher. You still had players out there that, when you threw a regular Etten in front of them, would tell you, "Oh, this is what it can do. This is how much damage. This is its armor class." And the dungeon master would just sit there and be like, "Well, that sucks. That's no fun for anyone." But there's always those kinds of players in D and D. Doesn't matter what. It is. Yep. So part of the power creep was, okay, you want more interesting monsters? And here's a half-red dragon cheat. That's my baby. I made the half-red dragon cheat, and it was awesome. Um, I became king of the half-red dragons in the Bandit Kingdoms, but we did a bunch of templates because you just didn't want to have another displacer beast or whatever, or another umber hole. Yeah. Oh, I, I think wow, that winged Etten sounds like a great idea. <laughs> that what, was, what was I still haven't used it tomorrow. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yep. Yeah, that was, that was one of my problems with some of it is that people had the monster manuals, knew what they were going into. At some point, I think it was maybe year four, um, I worked with Tim Sesh for something I was writing. I believe it was a, a meta regional called Whispering Harm. Yes. And I wanted a specific kind of monster that I couldn't find and uh after a bunch of back and forth he talked to the higher ups and they allowed me to basically design a monster from scratch and have it approved and so i ended up uh, creating a creature called a zambric which uh is another ripoff of another john carpenter movie the thing which was basically <laughs> yes! a a doppelganger vegetable that's awesome it was a plant creature I'm Michael, I think one of my first writing assignments in LG was for uh, the uh, the interactive at uh, the Ides of March in 2004, uh, and mm -hmm. I, I remember sending you my adventure for that my little mini mission that I wrote for some adventure tweaking and comments, and you came back with some really good stuff on that. So yeah, you were you were good for that. You you did you handled that a lot of that really well. I was definitely an idea person. Yes. Um, uh, achieving that idea on time, uh, no. I'm not very good at that. <laughs> well, well, we all have our burdens. So, you were, as far as, like, um, uh, progression, and you're absolutely right, I jumped to 597, we have some really detailed, uh, like, you said, all right, so there was an adventure to reclaim Clan Rock Hall, and then Clan Rock Hall is in here. And, and it, it, you know, it's it looks a lot uh. nicer, yeah, so... Uh, I found this here. You know, you have your steward of Rock Hall. You, I guess, you have score uh, affiliation score. No. Yeah, this is this was written dur during my Vern controls everything phase when oh. I had control issues. All right, let's hear it then. If you wrote this, let's hear it. Right. Well, I mean, at the time, uh, some of the three five splat books had started introducing uh, um, an organization concept called affiliations, where you had basically you earned your advancement in the organization was less due to your character level and more for what you accomplished on behalf of the organization, which dovetailed perfectly with what we wanted for year six to eight in Verbabank. We wanted the rewards you got to be based on, you know, who you helped, the choices you made um, for good or for ill, rather than, um, you know, three fights and a bag of gold. So as my friend Greg Homerding would put it. Okay. And so... At the time, I, I was, we were, you know, one of the things I was struggling to do was articulate this. And then affiliations came along in our made orgs and affiliations came along and it was a perfect way to do this. And I saw it as a way to shoehorn in a lot of backstory for made orgs because, you know, after six years, we've sort of developed our own regional canon, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, our history now for the la for at that time, this was written was six years worth of events in Verbabank. You know, that's that's now that was then just as important to people as the stuff that happened in the Temple of Elemental Evil or other places. And so the Meta Org certificate became a way to communicate that to them without having to include a whole bunch of information in adventures. You know, they would get it and get the backstory on their Meta Org. And you could also tell the sorts of things the Meta Org wanted you to do based on the sort of things they rewarded. We, um, we produced a lot of documentation. Yes, we did. I, I think that's one of the things that when I, when, when it was all over and we kind of sat around and Living Greyhawk was done and we looked at everything that was produced, we produced a lot of documentation. I mean, I've, I've worked in IT for most of my adult life and I have 
written tons of stuff and I've never written anything close to the amount of stuff that was produced by the Verbal Bank Triad over the course of LG. And there's stuff laying out there on the internet. There's stuff that Vernon's held on to that he's never released. Um, and, and I looked around and there's definitely other regions that have, have produced quite a bit too, but I mean, we, we're up there. Like we ain't, if we ain't number three or number two, I mean, you know. Some, uh, some really awesome stuff here. I'm going to ask, what is the, what is a bondsman of Estival? <laughs> He's laughing. Vernon's oh. laughing. Vernon, you're muted too. Yep. <laughs> you're muted. Still you're muted. muted. Oh, no, he had mic issues earlier today. There sorry, go. sorry. Oh. Yeah, sorry about that. No, um, no the in year eight, um, Lord Estival ended up becoming uh, the region of Verbabank when the Viscount went missing and had been missing for a long time for undisclosed reasons. And then we had a major assassination attempt that wiped out about two thirds of our existing nobility. Nice. And so Lord Estival, well, yes, we, we had as many, uh, we had we had about as many nobility as we had towns in the region on Anna's map. It was, you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting one. So it was sort of a, a of an administrative purge as well, but two thirds of our nobility was wiped out. And Lord Estival, out of the generosity of his spirit, um, took upon the burden of becoming regent of Verbabank himself in, in the absence of the Viscount. And immediately at that time, the mounted borderers, which we've been talking about, were dissolved. Um, and they were all absorbed into Bondsman of Estival, which was basically his noble house made of org. Um, so that, that, that just sort of gives you an idea of the esteem that people <coughs> held him in after that point. Because there's four, there's four companies of mounted borderers in the 597. So I guess then, then uh, they're still yes. around? Okay. Yes, there were, there were always four companies. Uh, Michael made sure to really differentiate them uh, when he built them. Wow. Um, when we get to these final certs uh, for the meta orgs, this is, a lot of this is also coming from players. Uh, some of the more active people, Bruce Raby, um, <laughs> Harry... Uh, Rob Silva was was a member before he even became a triad. I, they were giving feedback about a lot of this stuff, and and so they became more differentiated because as people were picking which company they were from, they were really forming it more and more and, and making traditions. That was the funny thing. Yes, players were making traditions that were never written by anything by me. Um, and all of a sudden I'm like, really, that's a thing like, okay, well, we'll take that in and I'll add it to the next interactive. And the so players were really kind of, it, it was a feedback loop. We, we would write something, players would come back and, and give it definition and, and give right. it weight, take you know, something tactile. So, you know, it's, it was amazing. Like, it's just, the whole thing was amazing. I, I look back and it's, you know, time well spent. Yeah, we also have to remember, especially the younger viewers have to remember that organizational tools, on, especially online ones, were not anywhere near what they are today. So, yes. so, so meaning you had the, the, what was it, Yahoo forums and, 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 and a few other. Yeah, the Yahoo groups. <laughs> exactly. Right. But meaning today we have 10 or 100 times more effective and, and, and world spanning kind of tools that make it makes it much easier to organize all this and and to share all the information and stuff and it was kind of was there any tools that way Sorry that was that. from 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 wizard of the coast or was it just like sold no. it and, and send out some pdf they didn't even buy it. us websites anna uh-huh the, yeah. the regions were responsible for getting their own yeah, that's why you had all sorts right. of weird solutions with weird urls and and, and, and so creating so. the content yeah. there was no pay for anyone unless you wrote yeah. a core mod or were a circle member and got a stipend right it was a, fr I, it was a franchise that you got into that you weren't going to make money it was a losing money proposition for the yeah. love of the game right it's yeah. exactly what it was the love of the game yeah. I, that's I, why we yeah. all dm i mean that's why we all play really for the yeah. most part some of us uh, you know have turned it into uh types of careers anna right sure. i mean but sure. for most of us but, it's because of the love of the game yeah but that also made the character of the Living Grey Hawk as a passion-driven campaign, yes. yep. not yep. A, 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 a driven up from from up from, from corporate, so to speak, as a as a PR stunt. It was had true passion and and community feel to it. That's my my sense, just hearing all the stories and and reading the stuff. So yeah. So I, mean, I did. 
Yeah. I didn't know anybody when I moved to Chicago other than maybe kind of going out. And it, it's been only through Living Greyhawk that I have retained friendships that will probably last me the rest of my life. And, yeah. and also learned about what it means to be part of a community and mentoring other writers and, and making sure that other people are wanting to, you know, to run stuff. And it definitely turned me from somebody who, you know, sat behind a table and, and was antagonistic with my players. I'm here to kill you and turned it into, uh, you know, I'm here to challenge you and I want to be part of this community and I want to grow other players. I'm, 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 I've become much more of an evangelist over the years for role-playing in general and D&D specifically. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's funny you should say some of the things you did, Anne, about it being a passion. I've made so many wonderful friends as a result of my involvement in Living Greyhawk. I would never have met Michael had we not you know, been d doing Living Greyhawk together. And we've been friends for 16, 17 years, or not, if not longer. Yeah. I've made other friends down here in Illinois that I never would have met. You know, uh, so much of what we did in the campaign would not have been possible without the friendships and the relationships that we made. I mean, it, it's, you know, especially it, it, it wasn't a job. It was a, it was in some ways like a calling, if you will, not, not to, not to over dramatize it, but we were, you know, we all, uh, we, we all couldn't have done these things without, without the, uh, the involvement of friends and people we met. And we were, it, was a, it was a wonderful time. Uh, it was an extremely stressful, exhausting time as well. But it was a wonderful time because when you got to see people enjoy the fruits of your labor on these things, as, as they do with the Meta Orgs and our adventures and the town project and everything else. Yeah, I can. I can. I, yeah. I, I was. I've been active in 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 Pathfinder online play, organized play for five six years, and 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 ran some games and played a lot. And and I must say, it gave me two things: a lot of friends. Some some of them will be like lifelong friends, and and it also gave me a good insight in the game. Meaning, I learned Pathfinder rules in a way that I haven't learned yes. any other rule system because I was you, all of a sudden you you got a lot of adventures that were written by people who knew it inside and out and it was there to present mechanics and stuff so 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 even if i wasn't that into galarian or, or stuff like that it was still a fantastic way to learn the game right. and you get a chance to play with different people almost every every other week or so and that also meant that i met different play styles different yes. ways of running the table and and it was fantastic all the, the 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 kind of the different insights into other people playing and you were also part of a community you can go to the game store and sit yep. down and you were you were part of the pack so to speak and, and and that was kind of that was an amazing feeling yeah I was working at a Walden Books in a mall in like 2002. I'd gotten out of the army a couple of years before that. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. I was working at this bookstore when some people came in to buy a Living Greyhawk Gazetteer. And I wish Gary Holian were in the audience tonight. <laughs> because yeah, that was directly related. I was like, oh, hey, I used to play D&D. &D. What's this book? And they told me what Living Greyhawk was. They played in it. I'm in Bryan College Station. It's uh, Texas A&M, a university town with a big sci-fi fantasy uh campus club and next thing i know i'm like creating a character and i'm playing and then a year later i'm doing meta org stuff and then a year later i'm doing secret missions and then a year later i'm a triad member until the end of the campaign and my buddy Britt, who became a circle member after having been a triad member was a groomsman in my first wedding a couple of years ago and he and i are still in touch um, you know, and there's many other friends of mine that I'm still in touch with that purely because those people came into a Walden Books one day right. when I had that crappy assistant manager job, yeah. uh, you know. Walden so. Books. Oh, my God. I know. Yeah. yeah. We're dating. We used to get D&D D &D stuff there regularly. Absolutely. I want to ask about this uh, org here, Meta Org, because I know Anna is an old faith or big time. So, Brethren yes. of the Old Faith, Obadiah, and Biori, which is really cool. And Ooh. any cert that looks like that, by the way, I, I pretty much designed. Oh, cool. So, you can ask yep. me anything about those. Uh, I, don't know that, I don't know that I'll remember an answer, but you can ask me anything. <laughs> so, was this big in uh, verbal, the Verbobank er, uh, area, the, uh, a lot of the Druidic types for the Old Faith? You you had some people that were interested in it, from what I remember. I mean, at least where I was at. I, I have to be honest. I wrote it most. I wrote it for two reasons, mostly for completeness, because the build faith was strong was strong in our region. But I also wanted to contrast 
how the old faith viewed nature with the church of Alona, which was in our region, because both are nature deities, but both approached nature very differently. And so one of the things I wanted to stress was, you know, you've got the nurturing aspect of nature with Alona, and then you've got the more, not, I don't want to say Darwinian, but, you know, the more harsher aspect of this is the way life is aspect with the old faith. And so I wanted to, I wanted to be able to contrast that for people in our region who are playing druids or nature characters so they could see the distinction between those two philosophies. Good enough reason. Okay. Awesome. I would also say that a lot of the a lot of the religious stuff we we really tried to put some differentiation in there that yes. made it a little more taste for our region than something that you got from the Living Greyhawk Gazetteer. Um, you know, it, it did outline quite a bit of the major uh, deities and demigods, but we we tried to kind of give it a little more flavor of this is how it's operating and. You know, so there was, there was a lot of work put into to oh, yeah. quite a few of those documents, for sure. I love this. Spurn your bane. You may not own any structures in any town. Nice. Well, and that that's that's something that, you know, when I, I, I joke about how controlling I was about this, but Michael can remember how, how, how much I had, had my fingers and everything. I was trying to give like a, a unified concept. And one of the things we did with those later meta orgs was tie them or in some way to the town project, which in, as, in some ways is our most successful meta org that was out there. It involved everybody to some degree. And so some, some, um, some meta orgs like the Church of St. Cuthbert and the Church of Rao ended up being eligible for certain kinds of, of uh, houses you could build that you, could, you couldn't get unless you were a member of those meta orgs. And so in the case with, uh, with the old faith, because they reject you know, civilization, what better way to, to reflect that than saying this character couldn't actually be a part of a town or had other hindrances that were a part of it. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Let me uh, jump in real quick. We have someone in the audience I want to I yes. want to put Anna in touch with. Yes. Uh, Anonsen from the Shieldlands. Yeah. Eric. Is, yes, Eric is a great mapper of Greyhawk. Yes. Oh, he, in fact, he's, he's fantastic. Yeah. And I highly recommend Eric, please reach out to me to be on a future show about Shieldland. Yes. Let's do it. Let's try to but yeah. please reach out to Anna to be on her mapping show if she'll have you. Because yeah, Eric made these like beautiful any, any maps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so please, uh, uh, Eric, do that. To, to all the stuff that I've done. Yep. So you got some options. We got the fantasy mapping show, and we have also a legends and lore either. Should be on both, but do we yeah, have a, to a topic for episode nine yet, Anna? I forget. Fantasy mapping show. No, we have some ideas. Okay, so we'll I'm going to let can, you in. Yeah. Listen but, to but we can definitely—they're not firm yet. So yeah, so we got Cave Geek yeah. Art at uh, at yeah. number ten at, at mm -hmm. Gary Khan. So yeah, very cool. Um, so um, Michael Vernon, bring up some topics we haven't. Like that, you know, some orgs that you, you thought were cool or some ideas. Um, I can always pop them up afterwards. Clan uh, Rock Hall. Yeah, I, okay. Uh, that's Clan, the, Clan Rock Hall was one of our, but besides the Mount of Borders, I think was one of our most popular meta orgs uh, that was out yeah. there. You, you had, uh, it's, it's on the map with, too. Yeah, it started with one of our first uh, year one adventures um, where uh, the PCs no, the rescued the, the, the Prince left. of Clan there Rock Hall. And yes. then ended up becoming that was what, what Giants on the Move? G uh, Giants on the Move, that's right. Yeah, that's Lon Lederman. He was pri primarily responsible for I think a lot I'm of the, sure gnome, the, move, yeah. uh, the gnome storyline. That was right. one of our original storylines. Uh, he also shepherded a lot of the writing and design about the gnomes, Rock Hall. Um, so yeah. he's, he's the one that was primarily responsible for a lot I of that storytelling. It might have even been before that in Noble Ambitions, the, our very, very first regional adventure where the PCs rescue him because he goes into the service of Lady Asbury. Um, but I, I think you might be right about him being in Giants on the Move as well. Yeah. But um, yeah, the Clan Rock Hall was basically our Mines of Moria um, for Verbabank. You know, with 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 some changes, um, right? But uh, they they became a very a very beloved. Uh, organization and group i mean and they gave out some rewards one of uh, one of the things ev almost every player had uh, if they've been playing for a while was a shield of rock hall, rock hall. Um, 
And so it really tied players to the region. So that's why that particular uh, made org has a, a lot more, a lot more detail to it than maybe say the brethren of the old faith because there was more regional more regional flavor that got infused into that because of as michael said the feedback we were getting from players and their actions um the uh the mithril guard uh the uh the earth wardens of clan rock hall all of that which i believe is on that cert or just things that people had wanted in our region they talked about they formed groups and they got they ended up getting codified uh, into uh, into the Meta Org, and that was our way of that was our way of rewarding player involvement, if you will. I remember Michael saying something to me early on, in, and uh, when I became triad, and that was, you know, players get out of the game what they put into it, and so we want to reward that involvement. And so we we tried to be as responsive as we could in these Meta Orgs, and, and as they evolved, um, and reward that investment in time for the players uh, so that they, they truly had a stake in the region. I'm going to ask you really, yeah, I'm going to ask you I, really, the, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, oh, I didn't want to interrupt. I was going right. to ask you a really I, stupid, dumb question. Can you, could you uh, be a non-dwarf and be an honorary member? The, the answer is yes to a degree. Like there, there was a certain amount that okay. you could get involved in some of these, but, it, but I, 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 you know, if you weren't part of, um, that culture, that society, like we'll call it from birth, then you were kind of like adopted, but not quite. I mean, there wasn't any rule that said, you know, we had players that played characters that were adopted by gnomes, adopted by elves who were, you know, from definitely another species and, uh, or had different ancestry and those players played it off well, you know, they found yeah. me as a baby and, you know, took me up and, you know, all my armor is really tight because I can only wear gnome armor on my medium-sized body, and, you know, things like that. So, I mean, you could, but usually it, when it came to the moving and shaking, uh, it was usually people who were more associated with those uh, right. characters. I'm there, sorry to interrupt was, you, Mensa, too, if you had another that, comment that, to make. No, I just, we, you were asking us about, like, kind of meta orgs. I, I, one of the things, I, I love Mountain Borders, but that's my baby. Um, but I, I also, the, the two of other things I got involved with were the Elven Clans of the Gnarly. Mm -hmm. And then I we started thinking about elves in general, and I liked the idea of having city elves. Um, elves that have known nothing else other yes. than trade, oh. other than diplomacy. And so we ended up doing uh, the Elven Enclave. In yep, right here. Yeah, right here. And, and so that was another one that I actually put together. And, and the oh. idea was that they were in a situation where they wanted peace, prosperity, they were much more even-tempered, um, they didn't have, uh, something that I saw in other regions was elves hating on humans or people who were coming into the forest, they were not them, they were very much like, hey, we've lived a long time, you need to relax, things will work out, and by the way, you know, diplomacy works best if everybody comes to the table unarmed. And so I, I wrote that from a definitely a different standpoint than the, the Elves of the Gnarly. Two of my favorites. Interesting. <laughs> Captain Ron, probably would need to ask Eric Mengi or Jose Ortiz that question, where one covers similar in detail to Orvin Clan for, for, say, the Geoff region. I think yeah, we, yeah, we should do a Joff show later this year just on their meta orgs. Yeah, Eric Jose will be will will be the ones to answer that question, Ron. Unfortunately, so I love I love this because you, you you allow uh, you know uh, additional equipment in here. Uh, pretty neat. This is a good. It's a cool idea. And, and you have no idea how much we could piss people off by the kinds of equipment we allowed or not allowed. Yeah, I remember. I remember. Uh, I remember a storm on the. Um, uh, on the Verbabont group in year six when uh, we gave Rangers of the Gnarly Forest hammocks as one of their rewards. Um, that, that's how tight it, equipment was. Oh, yeah. Golden Living right. Greyhawk. If it wasn't from the player's handbook, basically, you had to find access to it during an adventure or through your meta org. And then there might only be certain times a year you could buy it. As the new splat books came out, the circle and the RPG would review the item and would say, okay, this is good for Greyhawk, this isn't good. And you can now begin incorporating into your meta org. So I bet this Elven Enclave, I can't see because of the resolution, but I bet you gave access to the Elven weapons. Like, 
the elven blade singing sword or whatever that. Oh yeah, that yeah. There's stuff in there. Yeah. Harp, right? Elven double bow. You right. You couldn't just buy those things and say like, oh hey, look, I'm showing up with this awesome right. stuff from what was the book Races of the Wild? Yeah. yeah. 3.0 things like that, and then the 3.5 splat books and the hardback books and whatnot. So you had to. Some people would look through the meta orgs to build their characters, and other people would build their characters and then look through the meta orgs just for role playing. So it, it served both purposes. Right. But but people wanted more access to things, which was where the pissed offness came from, because they were looking at the list and and hammock became just the focal point for a few people's anger. It's like you're giving me a hammock. I, yeah, the only I thing- loved giving <laughs> the little stuff like the only that. Thing that- the only thing that made them more upset is the curses we put out. Yes. We were also Uh-oh. the other thing we were known for is the curses. Uh, give me an example. Give us an uh, example one. I uh so we we did we did a basically a one-time event. It was uh we'll call it like a battle adventure interactive where you actually went to the Emedio jungle and on a trade mission and you met uh natives there and, and people who are already there and attempting to kind of secure rights and negotiate with with them and uh one of the things you could get is basically a evil snake idol and uh and you immediately know and then as triad we told you it is an evil object and people kept them and there was 10 <laughs> people that kept them and you had to basically say after three, like three times warning it, this is an evil object. They're like, is it an item? I was like, it is a certain item. Okay, I want it and I will keep it. And then we gave you the cert to read. And then we gave you one more chance. Do you still want to keep it? Oh, we wouldn't have given you a second chance. Yeah. <laughs> so we did because it was really, really, I, I don't know if uh, Vernon has it. He can post it. I know I got a copy of my phone. But uh, basically you had to sacrifice human beings to get a bonus. And every day when you started, you rolled on a chart to see what kind of bonus you got. And so if you got a plus two bonus, it was usually like you roll on one chart, it's attack bonus, armor class bonus, saving throw. Um, and then you got a number bonus based on your level. And then anybody you adventured with got the same bonus doubled as a negative modifier to that. <laughs> so if you got a plus two to attack, everybody around you that was an ally of yours, got a minus four to attack. And those 10 people became pariahs as people started figuring out, like, why am I not hitting this thing? So at (laughs) that level, 15th level, you know, you're taking basically a minus, they're getting a plus four to hit or plus four to their saving throws. And the other people are getting minus eight to their saving throws and can't figure out why they can't save on things. And eventually through word of mouth and talk, uh, the 10 players basically became social pariahs and never played the characters again. It, it became a, a watch Ron phrase. Ron was one of them. It became, you, one of the things you had to do was be careful what you wished for uh, in Vermont wow. because you, you, you could get it. And there was not like it. Oh my. Not Verbabonk, but there was a court special that was the Ghost Tower of Inverness, right? You converted yeah. it for a third edition special at one of the major cons. And there was a thing in there, which I think like the original adventure, when it went off, would turn your character completely white, white. including all your gear. Remember. And that was actually asserted adventure record thing that you were cursed. Like no one could turn you back to your normal appearance and colors. I think my character, one of my characters had that for a little while until they got like a wish spell. Yeah. To was get it, it like removed. Gen Con 2008, 2009? Yeah, I'd have to look it up. But yeah, it sounds... Well, not 2009, because we, we know that was... Parsec Ironclad well, yeah, says he got it. it. Yeah, he got yeah, it. Yeah, that's Patrick from the Bandy Kingdoms. Yeah. Um, it's good to see Patrick in the audience. It was a special. Patrick, well, Patrick has resistance to lightning, for those of you playing 5th edition. Go look up uh, uh, the America's Guide talent of um, uh, Architect. Interesting. So, um, Mensa, so when did you wind down your participation? Was it till the end? Uh, I was actually out before the end. Uh, Between work, I actually ended up becoming part of a a acquisition integration team for our company. And we bought uh, bought another company that was uh, basically doing like space shuttle missile system stuff. So I had to 
moved to California for a bit. Uh, and then uh, they were kind of talking about doing 4E, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. I just, I didn't have the time for it, you know. So the convention I was running, uh, I think Cheryl just kind of took over that with that I ran with her. And then ultimately uh, really kind of backed out of some of that stuff and really didn't return uh, doing that. I did a lot of other, I did Pathfinder for God, many, many years. And then I moved on to like just doing Traveler and what have you. And then I waited till 5e and then ended up writing an adventure for 5e. Oh, you did? Yeah, I won, uh, won a, uh, in any. Uh, Which one? 2017. Uh, best organized play, Silver. No, no, no. Uh, Which adventure? End of the line. It, for, was that a D&D &D Adventures League or? Adventures League, yeah. Very cool. Oh, okay. I lost you, and, Marks uh, you and Rob, and Claire you and Rob Silver were both uh, candidates that year, if I remember. Yeah. I thought Rob was going to win, in all honesty. His was good. Did you do anything with Living Forgotten Realms after Living Greyhawk? Uh, no. Because one of the things we've talked about on other shows is the burnout we all had because we spent oh, so much time doing Living Greyhawk that some of us, Brandon, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Conrad, Brandon Gill, uh, went on to do Living Forgotten Realms conventions, but he didn't last very long, I think, because of the burnout and other issues. But people have had a moment to take a breath, and they're deeply involved in Adventurers League. I, I think I think everything that they've kind of done, and, and it obviously constantly evolves, they try to make it easier for players to get in there. If we look at some of the documentation from the early Living Greyhawk and compare that to how eventually works right now, I mean, there was a bar there where people like, you know, I don't want to do a living accounting. And, you know, and that's still kind of a chime that people say to this day. And I think that they've made that bar much easier to kind of get over for people who want to get involved with it. Uh, you know, there's definitely people out there writing it. And I think they're also tapping people who weren't, you know, I think a lot of people from Living City into the Living Greyhawk were a lot of RPGA people. And I think now Adventures League is starting to get other voices, other writers, people with definitely different perspectives on, on the game, different stories to tell. And I, right. I think that's amazing. They're just, you know, bringing a lot more people in there and doing uh, a lot of great things, you know. So, or, but I, I was able to at least write one of them and I was going to write a second that's still in my brain. One day I might. Well, you should. For the living accounting reference, I love it. And the reason why we use the phrase living accounting is I don't know if you can see this, but this yeah, was oh my, my character's sheet for tracking magic items their charges and their uses so like here are like three wands of cure light wounds that this character went through during her adventures all tracked and then like you know a dusty rose prism iron so stone and various <laughs> things like that oh and then on the back here is an example of eric and nonsense map yeah. work that he did for greyhawk this is his bandit wow. kingdoms i don't know if this is my modified version of it because he was kind enough to let me edit in the Bandit Kingdoms towns, but you can see Eric has this very beautiful. I've linked his uh, DeviantArt. Gorgeous, I've linked his DeviantArt twice in in chat. Yep. Yes, I, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, nice. Uh, yep. Vernon, did you send me something? Yeah, I uh, I was uh, going through some stuff. I couldn't find uh, Michael's uh, certificate on that wonderful uh, serpentine statue, but I did find something we did that pertains to Meta Orgs. It was uh, our final fate adventure record which ties heavily with the Meta Orgs and the towns and the project. When yeah. the campaign ended, uh, we put together a, um, a final adventure record for as, as sort of a capstone. This is your last uh, Living Greyhawk adventure record for this character that you could use to, to as, a, as a way to kind of wrap up how your character finished out in the game. And it, 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 there's a number of options in there. A lot of them were based on the adventures you played, where your character lived in the town project. And it was a, it was a, it was a way for us to sort of say thank you to the players of the region for all their involvement over the last eight, over the, that eight year time frame. How many did you end with? Beautiful. Players, you think, at the end? Oh, Lord. It's, yes. Thousand? Uh, I, I would say, I would say about between a thousand to fifteen hundred. <sighs> Um, and and, and that crazy. number what that number would literally grow up exponentially if, during uh, July when Gen Con was going on because we would always run a except we would always run a midnight madness uh, during that time frame maybe for a day or two before Gen Con started where people could just come and you know gorge on Verbabank adventures so 
And so <laughs> during that time frame, everybody that came early, we had, you know, probably five, 10,000 people, you know, playing games in our region, I, I would guess. Wow. It never even occurred to me. I went to Gen Con once in 2004. And I think I had, you know, because of work, it was fly in Friday night and fly out Sunday morning. And I think I was there to play the Mag God's Key special tie-in mm -hmm. adventure, I think it was. Um, and then maybe run a band of Kingdoms Midnight Madness. I don't I didn't even have time to even think about, oh, I could play some verbal exactly. ball. Right. There's a whole Wednesday that they would do uh eventually oh, man, once that would have been awesome. Out. Yeah. Right. And and that, those were the uh those were the years when uh Gen Con had moved to Indianapolis. Obviously, during the first part of the campaign, it was still in Milwaukee. But when it moved to Indianapolis, it was a boon for our region in terms of players coming in to you know well, yeah, drink you from local oh, I bet. Yeah. oh yeah. This time. yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a, it was a major fun time. Would and, it be can I can I ask you about Gen Con real quick and derail real quick? Sure, go for it. Were the Verba Bonk DMs like a lot of the core Gen Con DM, do you think for Living Greyhawk, or do you think they were from all over the place? Just the people who came and they wanted were, they were from all over the place. Yeah. I when I got involved with the RPGA um and then started doing uh game days and then eventually convention, I I was the guy who did eight slots to get a quarter of a hotel room, you know, and get my badge. And and that was one of the ways you met other either seasoned DMs or people who were already kind of DMing and they were from everywhere. Like even from Europe, people were coming and, and judging. And they, at that time they were still doing like uh, the open, you still had the open, you still had the feature, all the classic series of uh, adventures that they used to host. So there was a, there was people from all over. So it definitely wasn't just an Illinois, Indiana thing supporting right. Gen Con or even Milwaukee. Although probably Milwaukee, there was quite a few people up there that were, Central that you know obviously helped run it. Did Living Greyhawk use the Saga Mall Ballroom back in those days as well? I, Just... No, they what they used was uh, if you come to the front of the building across from the parking structure, there used to be a ballroom there on that corner oh. where the steps kind of come down. So, in and this is before they did the big expansion, they were oh, okay. up front. I think it's West Street and something here, but they were on the direct front, which would basically be the northeast corner. There was an exhibit hall there that they used for the RPGA. Mm -hmm. I think because someone told me that that played because Paiso had it for for the for 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 Pathfinder organized play, and someone said, "Well, we took it over from Living Greyhawk." So 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 maybe they had it maybe the last time or something like that because that was the the biggest ballroom in in at at the uh, the Gen Con at the, um, the exhibit or the yeah my no, under don't, don't yeah. go yeah it, it was a rabbit hole yeah no well I mean, just I think my my understanding of it was that uh, Wizards of the Coast got out of the convention business oh that's true they left and then, that and, yeah mm -hmm. and Dave and Christ was, was kind yeah. enough to kind of come in there and you know and he, and he had already been running things like Winter yeah. Fantasy and so, running so the back that, end was that stuff. before Living Greyhawk ended that Wizard of the Coast kind of got out of the convention circus or didn't run I think it was just after that at some uh -huh. point yeah. 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 I mean but Mr. Chris would be the one to talk about that kind oh, of history oh, yeah. but I think that was the thing is that they they kind of uninvested themselves in the infrastructure of all that kind of stuff yeah. and you know because they used to do like in the exhibit hall they used to have the big D, D castle and you'd go there i yeah. remember in the mid 2000s they were giving away books roll a big die get a free book get a box of minis you know and i think maybe they just didn't pay for itself or something yeah i'm definitely not the guy to answer that question <laughs> <laughs> so as we're coming up on uh, the time here um why don't we uh give uh michael and vernon a little uh synopsis on uh, experiences and any other highlights you want to talk about or low lights or anything else uh vernon what do you what do you think oh wow i mean you know living greyhawk was just such a a roller coaster ride for me um the the meta orgs and 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 doing all of that it, it's it's hard to it's hard to kind of summarize all of it because I, I as i mentioned i i've made so many friendships with it uh i i got to I got to play on a scale that I've never been able to play at before. Um, you know, when you're writing a campaign that, again, 10,000 people are going to be a part of, it really punches up your campaign uh, design skills um, because you got to be able to accommodate, you know, a lot. 
everything people can throw at you or have a way to answer it in some way. And it's, I, I will never see it's like again because of the, there's too many legal hurdles, I'm sure. And it's just too cumbersome for some companies to want to dive into. But it was such a, such a fascinating experiment and such a, such a wonderful time to game when you had all of these regions writing eight, eight to nine adventures a year, plus three or four interactives, plus 20 core spe plus 20 core adventures. I mean, you, you, you had to actively work not to play adventures. I mean, you, if, if you weren't getting your fill of gaming, it was your own damn fault, basically. Okay. It, and it was such a, such a powerful time. And I, I, I mean, I, I, I rave to everybody I talked to about gaming, about the relation, the working relationship I had with Michael Menza and with Rob Silva, who passed oh. away. Um, I, I mean, every triad I've worked with has been phenomenal, but you know, there, there was a, there was a synergy that the three of us had that was just, it, it was everything you wanted in, in, in a working relationship with people. And, and, I, and I've told Michael this, and I don't mean to make him blush, but now's my chance to tell him publicly in a, in a forum. And I don't I usually think, blush unless I'm drunk, so. Right, well, fair <laughs> enough. Um, but but just, just to tell him publicly in a forum how, how grateful I was for that time to work with him. Mm. I love you, Verona. <laughs> Back at you, buddy. So Mensa, what do you think, man? What, do you, what would you like to say? I, I think I was extremely lucky to meet some of the people I got to meet and, and make friendships with. Um, I, I, I'm thankful for the people who shepherded me around when I knew literally nothing about uh, conventions, organized play. Um, you know, Cheryl Ruby, Rick Brown, um, you know, come to mind, uh, you know, uh, Joshua kind of rose, um, you know, and, and then what I was able to do for people who kind of coming in was the same thing. And I think that that informed me. I, I love meeting new players. I love talking about the game. I love talking about other role-playing games. Uh, I, you know, I've had some life change, so I'm in Detroit now versus there. So I miss all those people and hope to get back to once the pandemic's over to safely game with uh, everybody. I mean, here I'm kind of hitting the ground running, you know, trying to get a community going. I've met some great people, Sean Erdman, Travis McCain, you know, and, and working with Border Keep Games to kind of start uh, doing uh, some community organized games and hopefully some conventions here with, uh, you know, the help of uh, their manager, Derek. So, I mean, I'm still doing stuff. I just, you know, Living Greyhawk's gone. I love it. I've learned a lot of things about it. And, you know, uh, the show must go on, I guess, you know. Are you That's playing my, any Greyhawk at all now? D&D? Uh, &D? Yeah. Um, I'm playing a little bit. I mean, a lot of it is, uh, you know, from the Adventure League standpoint, uh, it's hard to kind of get those things. And you can play in Adventure League anywhere you want. Um, so some of it is playing home games. Uh, Sean okay. Erdman, uh, somebody I met, uh, is, has a real love. It just started writing, and he's actually put together some compelling stuff. Uh I met somebody, Travis McKean. He's looking at some of those old school uh, kind of redos and running things like Five Torches Deep uh, for us. And then I'm mostly focusing my stuff on like Traveler and uh, doing some Gamma World at some point. Okay. Nice. So, but I, at some point, I still got a 5e Adventure League mod in my head. I just still got to figure that out. Very cool. Well, we we really appreciate you both coming here today. Um, yeah, this was fantastic. Sharing, and sharing yep. these and sharing these experiences. And here's the thing: we didn't like go over every single meta org, but we scratched the no. surface and we went over some key ones. And just note that the level of detail is pretty uh, pretty incredible. Along with well, the have verbal... us back, we'll talk about more. Of course, yeah. of course. <laughs> You know, and the Verbalbank Town Project, the Overpopulation Project in, uh, yes. in Verbalbank, mm -hmm. which is really uh, which is really cool. They were making a lot of babies. Yeah, they were doing something. They were doing something. So uh, it was in the water. Yeah. yeah. The, the sad thing is, most of the children were named Chim Chim. <laughs> <laughs> not enough dragons to eat the kids. So uh, we we got some wonderful announcements. So let's see what everyone's up to. So uh, Vernon, we'll start with you. What what's going on, man? You got anything you want to shout out? Well, um, I'm not. I'm not doing a whole heck of a lot gaming wise, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm married to a wonderful wife and kids and, and, and life takes up time like that. I, I just came back from a, 
the winter war gaming co- convention in champaign illinois so that was my ration of gaming for the for the the month so far nice uh played a bunch of peso saw some people that i from the greyhawk days and other places that i haven't seen in a long time and uh, so that that was good to kind of get back in that water especially after the pandemic kind of put a, a damper on a lot of that um, lately I've been, do- I've been doing karate. I think I mentioned that one of the last times, uh, I was on here. I just tested a few months ago for third degree brown belt. So I'm really proud of that. Um, and then I've got two more degrees to go before I test for black. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And, um, so that kind of keeps, that kind of keeps me active there. And then I did have two things I want to plug. I, I, I've mentioned, I, I do a voice acting work. Um, I'm, uh, nice. I'm involved with a, uh, with a Star Wars uh, audio drama right now called uh, Knights of the Old P- Republic Resurgence, and it's put on a, by a group called Typhon Media Productions. Um, I think if someone does a Google search for either of those two phrases, uh, Knights of the Old Republic Resurgence or Typhon Media, you'll probably come across the website for it. Um, can you, ironically, can you send me a link? Cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, At some you point. put it in I'll, chat, I'll too. You put it in chat, yeah, Brent. I'll, does yeah, that I'll tie into the old Republic it. MMO at all? Uh, yes, it's uh, it's part of that it's part of that same uh, that oh. same uh, story arc Ooh. involving some of the disciples of Raven and things like that. Nice. So, so Revan is um, is it Raven yeah. or Revan? Uh, Revan, I believe. Yeah. Re- okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now this is this is volunteer. I'm doing it out of the goodness of my nice. heart, but it's a lot of fun, and I'm working with some professional people, so I'm I'm really happy about that. And then the second thing I want to plug is uh, com- completely unrelated to gaming, uh, but it's really cool. My niece, uh, Lillian Camp, has started a not-for-profit group uh, to raise uh, for, for growing food to deal with uh, people who, have, who don't have a lot of food. It's called the Food Equality Project. And uh, she's 22 years old, and she is an incredible young lady. And um, if you search, go on Facebook and search for Food Equality Project, you'll find a link to it. Uh, it's an urban farm in Kentuckiana, uh, basically trying to combat food inequality. And uh, I applaud her for that. And she doesn't know I'm doing this. I'm, I'm, very cool. I'm, so I'm, uh, I'm plugging, her, uh, plugging her thing right now because I'm so very proud of her. Awesome. Yep. Great, very great, cool. great to hear. And uh, Fernand, as always, thank you for coming back on. You are most Pleasure. welcome, Jay. This is a blast. Excellent. Menza, what do you want to shout out? Uh, none. I mean, I thanks for having me. I'm usually sure. not fit for human consumption. And <laughs> I tried to be on my best behavior. Oh, uh, you so, were fine. This was fantastic. Um, yeah. And like I said, more often than not, there is usually probably a really good bad story about me and probably a really funny story about me. But uh, that's it. Thanks for having me. And thanks to anybody who was ever a triad, wrote something for LG. Um, I mean, you know, it's... It, I hate to say it sound this way, but serving a player community can be hard, can be rewarding. I think anybody who's thought about writing, write. Um, the more you write, the better you'll get. Let people critique it. I am not a great writer, but I like writing. I like ideas. And I think anybody who has the bug, you should absolutely do it. And maybe I'll come on next time and share some of my fan fiction for Andy Griffith and Mayberry um, that I've written. <laughs> Um, but, uh, other than that, like support your local gaming community. If there's not one, create one. Um, I, having come back to Detroit, uh, after 20 years, I'm in Port Huron trying to do that very thing from the ground up and, you know, embrace new players. Don't let them be scared of the game and that's it, you know, and, and let everybody to your table. You know, the more players we have, the more voices we have. The, the greater amount of difference we have with the people we play with uh, is going to be a learning experience. Very well true. Said. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so very much for coming on tonight. Really appreciate Thanks. it. So the, I think this is the most quiet he's ever been, and it's, he's been quiet a lot lately. Mike, what's going on, man? Uh, well, it's been a hard day, guys. Oh, so sorry. I, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Um Interestingly, uh, Verbal Bonk is my uh, would have been my home uh, country if I had participated in Living Grog. Yeah. Um, I wasn't involved with the Grog community, just not the convention side. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Very interested in the uh, mounted borders and you know s- stuff like that. I'd like to hear more about meta orgs, of course. Uh, so I hope you guys are around more in the community, maybe some of that into stuff we're doing on Cannon Fire or whatever. Um, 
so as usual, it was very interesting. You know, thank you, Casey, Michael, Vernon, for uh, an entertaining trip back in time. And, and again, uh, Anna, I'm a huge fan. So I imagine Michael, uh, um, uh, Mike Bridges will be talking a little bit more next week when we talk about our special guest for next week already set. So uh, oh. Casey, what's up with you? So, hey, thanks again, guys, for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I hope the audience had a, a great time. I think these, these shows, we're going to do one a month because they're just me. I never got to play in verbal bond. So it was fascinating hearing about the region. Next month, uh, March 2nd, we have Ket. Well, probably an overview because we haven't had Ket on yet. Steve Baker, who also became a meta regional coordinator of the VTF meta region after he was a cat triad member so he'll be able to talk about cat and some of these larger overarching meta regional plots as well um and i'm trying to get david christ uh, or christ back on for that one as well christ. of bald man games um and then if christoph were here oh, oh wait uh, another triad i'm trying to work through and i need to give a shout out to earth scribe a Earth Scribe has a line on the Pale Triad. Oh, but good. it's through a friend who's in Europe on vacation. So that one's <laughs> going to take a little while to put together. But I'm okay. hoping to get the Pale Triad, which was California and Nevada during Living Greyhawk, and we haven't had them on yet. So everyone, keep your fingers crossed. Oh, you okay. sound like a mafioso of... trying to track down someone in witness it's protection. Great. <laughs> yep, it is awesome. Um, I'm impressed. If Christoph were on, I'd be busting his chops. Editing the OJ, lots of work. I think we saw a Dewey Carthen, Rick Miller on earlier today, former editor. But in the next OJ, which I'm very anxiously awaiting, will be my article on Seton, the town in Keelan, next to the town of Saltmarsh. In my 5e home game, Ghosts of Saltmarsh, I had a side quest go off over to Seton. There's nothing in it in canon. So I fleshed it out for this adventure, and then I said, well, I'm going to write this up and send it off to Kristoff. And Gary Holian, the expert on Gillen, was kind enough to uh, review it and give me some suggestions for it. And That's I'm great. actually really proud of the piece. Uh, so I'm, I'm awesome. waiting on that. Great. And then we mentioned Lord Obney, Hammer of Ayu, <laughs> earlier tonight. Yeah. Lord Obney is a villain in my Ghosts of Saltmarsh campaign because in canon, there's a line that says he's wanted for murder in Keelan. So I said, hmm, what's he wanted for murder for? I had him murder people in Seton. My PCs were trying to murder, investigate, catch him. And I didn't like the 5e stats they gave him in Tales from the Yawning Portal. So I have turned him into a real proper badass. And Kristoff has uh, promised to publish his monster stat block in the same issue of the Earth, Earth Journal. So, awesome. And I have that. He, he can straight up murder people in the first round of combat. He's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and really, that's other than a side project, I've now decided that there are too many gods in the multiverse and Greyhawk. I have begun a project for fun where I am consolidating all of the religions of Earth, taking hey, this god is too similar to this god. I'm going to make them the same god, and these are just different aspects that so different cultures are doing. Here, yeah, yeah I, am, I am whittling them down. So I am, I am two-ninths of the way through. I've done lawful good and neutral good, and I'm working my way down. But I'm also going to integrate them into the celestial powers. So maybe there's a lawful evil greater god who is really Asmodeus. It, just a different aspect of them. That that kind of thing is what I'm thinking. And in my mind, Interesting. in Forgotten Realms, we have the Overgod Owl, right? Ao. Mm -hmm. I have a theory that Thrizden was Greyhawk's Overgod, and all the other gods rose up to overthrow him because he was going to destroy the Old Earth when he went crazy. So this was a future article I'm working on. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Casey has always great setup and prep work for this. Amen. And thank you. Yeah. We could not do any of these without you. And we really appreciate it. It's been awesome. Really fantastic discussion. Anna. Okay. So, so yeah. Uh, so it, nothing new, but they're new details, so to speak. So the, the, the 22, uh, 2022 edition of the Flanny's Hepmonale map is going into its finals. So I'm, I'm, 
prepping, there will be a release candidate coming out now and there will be a deadline. So anyone who come up with things that, and I have a couple of people who said that, oh, I found things and they're going to send me information. So I want that by Monday. Otherwise I will set the deadline. And Snooze if after lose. Monday, then, then because I need to start working on the Atlas stuff. So I need to have all the features that will be on the, this edition of the map nail up. But if you give it to me afterwards, I'll save it because there will be future updates too. So, so it doesn't disappear forever, so to speak. It's just that I need to nail down this one and go into production, so to speak, rather than updating and editing and, and, and all that stuff, so to speak. That's gone on now. So, so there might be features that will spill over for, for future editions too. But that goes in and, and the, the, uh, the Atlas part. So I'm going to split it up to, there will probably be just over a hundred or just about a hundred pages. So the, the whole map, because now we're expanded it with Hepmona land and, and more. So it's, it's going to be a hundred pages, roughly a hundred pages. So there will be layouts and stuff coming to my patrons this week. And there will be more heraldry coming this week too. Yes. And you get a Verbabank shield. Oh yes. The Verbabank is coming. Yep. Mm -hmm. Verbabank is coming. Yep. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to give it, but the thing is it's been, I don't know if it will be in this one, but I'll have to update it and, and put it in. I've, I've gone through all the ones that I've done before and, and simply take them in alphabetical order. So I wouldn't for, forget anyone. And since V is kind of down the, the alphabet, but I'll, I'll prioritize it and get it in there. So, yep. See, and see, it's a lot of fun. See, Vernon, you, you want a Ferber box shield, but I got a Slav squat squad shield. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, we have to, to uh, put a few extras in there. And I've also <laughs> uh, done this, a whole bunch for my own Shield Lens campaign going on too. And and, mm -hmm. and a bunch of Iusian Shields and stuff that, that I wanted heraldry for and, and various old Shield Lens. There many old the, the cities I, and, and towns and stuff in, in Shield Lens. So I then first I had to do the old ones that when it was Shield Lens. And, and, mm -hmm. and at first I had to add really old ones and then the little bit modern. And then now I have the Iusian ones too, so to speak. So, so there's a bunch of them there i have presented most of them but there will be upcoming posts with i did because i didn't want to post them too early because i don't want to spoil for my players and i don't want to spoil for people that go and play in D D in the castle in this fall in in england because i want to keep some of these things i've been blabbing enough of, of the stuff on this show already so 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 but there are some some secret factions and heraldry and stuff that will come so that will come this fall winter and 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 during next year, there will be way more campaign stuff and, and some campaign maps and stuff. But so that's basically what's going on for the moment. So, so they will be moving into Atlas territory and there will be kind of locked down on the 2022 edition. And then up you start moving on the 20, on the 598 map versions too. Awesome. Here we go. Yeah. It's tomorrow night. Oh, isn't it lovely? Skeets' hideaway. The halfling... <laughs> Tom's halfling character, 10th level halfling thief, has bought a, a, a little pub tavern in Hardby because he wants to just have fun with his friends. But nothing is ever that easy. So uh, adventure number 943 with the new Hardby heraldry on the, sh the throne and what Anna did, which is beautiful. That was, that was the, another one that, that this is the premiere, so to speak. We Because yeah. we, we had a... a, a, a Brian Bloomklotz did a, a, a huge, I think, cool upgrade to it. But then uh, we were thinking and 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 kind of um, talking a little bit. Oh, I scratched something here. So oh, I'm okay. sorry, Anna. It's, no, no, that happens. So so, so um, we were th uh, thinking that that we had the wooden throne and stuff, and I thought maybe we should kind of do something about this. So, so I, I put the, we, we kind of enhanced it with the wooden throne and, and, and some, yeah, some there was it like looks a staff and some swords and stuff, and then kept the lotus flower and the colors too. So, so now <laughs> we have a, a heraldry that I think could be kind of cool for, for the, the city of, of Hardby as well as the Hardby Mariners and stuff. It, it, it's fantastic. So just know this will be a fun thief based adventure tomorrow. We'll see how that goes. Uh, and hey, this is the first. Uh, uh, you're gonna get me out my little, the little violin there, uh, Troy. This is my first time in, in uh, since before Christmas. I only had three streams, so I don't have something going on, on the weekend. So I stay married. So uh, just note that that's uh, that's when that's tomorrow night, and then uh, we have a big gab in our tenth roundtable discussion. So I got the uh, Robert Hartley GM from New Zealand, and he is a he is a big big 
deal when it comes to Twitch and far as uh, viewer numbers and 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 like uh, he's got a huge following along with uh, MJ Russell, a newer DM, and Dave from Guild Superior will join Anna and me for a little roundtable discussion um, on on Sunday evening. Uh, that'll be. Uh, That'll be a, a, a good one as well. What are we doing for Legends and Lore next week? Well, Rick Miller is coming on a discussion with Dewey Carthen. All right, so we're going to have him on for the first time. And we'll just talk whatever he wants to talk about, Earth Journal, uh, his, his contributions. He sent me a bunch of uh, information today. So that'll be a nice one. Uh, for three times, Casey showed his cats. Thanks, Troy. Very kind. Really appreciate it. So, uh, isn't it every, yeah, three stream, <laughs> uh, that's it for this week. Yeah, but uh, Dewey Carthon will, will be on next week. Uh, looking forward awesome. to that. Yep. All right. Let's, sorry I'm dragging on here. I have to discuss this, but it's only three Saturdays away, counting this upcoming one. Our fourth annual Greyhawk Megastream fundraiser event is here very shortly. I have finalized the sponsors today. For There Will Be Dragons, our fourth annual. Here They're all listed there. Larry Elmore, I just got them, gave me five 34 by 20 dragon prints all signed for giveaways for this. So he was I just, a great guest. Yes. He was yeah. a fantastic guest a couple weeks ago. Troller Games, $200 in items. Reaper, $200 in items. Infinite Dimensions, $200 in items. Stratagem, a free city of Greyhawk box set that's still sealed. Okay, it's oh, a oh. Yes. Okay, it's over here. It's up there. Um, Gamescape 3D, two hundred dollars in items. Cave Geek Art, uh, Kafir stepped it up even more. He's going to give some prints. He is. He and I are working on a custom. If you've ever seen his work, I'm going to I'm going to pop up a picture here real quick for everyone uh, to see his style, which is caveman style. Really, basically, it's beautiful stuff. Uh, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Where the hell did I put the picture? You know, don't you hate it when, 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 when uh, here it is, best laid plans. There we go. Okay. So he's done Middle Earth. He's done Forgotten Realms. He's done Dragonlance, all these. Um, and you can see these are all hanging on this, uh, on this leather, right? Yeah. As you can see. He's awesome. So yeah. we are working on a Greyhawk city area map, which goes from Temple of Little Evil to the West to the Doom Grinder to the east, and thing highlights in between. Okay, that'll be the area that this map will be done. Now, nice. if I really wanted to be a dick, I'd make it the Free City of Altamira, <laughs> but I'm not going. I'm kidding. No, I, it's it's Greyhawk. See how big the, the yeah. The no, it's just Greyhawk. Like it's just the Greyhawk it. area. You know, and I may have Harby on it. We're we're gonna do highlights and all. So when he tells me, he does these. Oh. Um, he commissions between three. It, these commissions are between three and five thousand dollars. Because the work is how many hours? Hundreds of hours, Anna. It takes. I don't do know these. how long, but it, it's yeah. a lot of hours. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Here they is. They look so cool. Yeah. Here is the target for this year. We did ten thousand and forty dollars last year over uh, over two days. We have it now three days, and we have nine streams. If we do twenty thousand dollars to St. Jude. One of the complimentary gifts will be this map. So a three to $5,000 item will be on the list of complimentary gifts. So the top donator will be able to pick that. Okay? Yeah, well, Dorgum, that would be awesome. The goal is to hit $20,000 over the course of this through Tilt of Eye. And that will be, and that will open up this. Now that he's going to give us prints as it is. So I'll give a signed prints as you can see some of them there. They'll be part of, a, of, of him being a sponsor, but he will actually give that map away for you like that rob so uh, I, I you know only to give what you can afford for saint jude but i'm what i'm saying is i'm really excited about this just kind of put us i would hope so wayne i would really hope so um so just know there be dragons and there are our sponsors all great companies man i'm so excited that we have it's actually eight because strategy and Wizdice dice are the same company same affiliate uh you know corporate headquarters so i don't, I don't have their logo up twice here are the nine Streams plus Greyhawk Reborn. I will have the stream schedule out. And Greyhawk Reborn will have open sign up events you can sign up for to play in. There's and you have to pay a fee. That'll go in to the fundraiser as well. All right. So nine plus Greyhawk Reborn. That'll be on uh, uh, what's it called Warhorn for that. So just note 
It's coming. You're gonna. I will start since I don't have a game this Saturday. I'm gonna start blasting out these ads. You may have seen some. I've I've kind of tweaked them and uh, uh, a little teaser today, but they will be going out and a lot of details on the St. Jude fundraiser. Note that Eric Mona is playing in my game. Venerian Vord is back. And, and there will be dragons. And the Ever Mysterious Tim is helping me on the bad guy side. So just imagine that. All right. Just imagine the craziness that's going to happen there. Balfron, if we hit 30, shave your beard. Let's let's get to 20 first, pal. Okay. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Can you imagine? <laughs> so let we did 10. We expected to do like 6,000 last year. We did 10. Let's let's try. Let's go for it. So I will be. And we're going to have a. We're gonna, uh, so one last thing. The Sunday of the Super Bowl, I have no Gavin. Because my wife would kick my ass. The day after, I know it's Valentine's Day, but my wife's not in the Val. We're gonna have a gab in the night of Valentine's Day. If you got, can't make it, no big deal. It'll be the prelude show to that to the fundraiser event. We'll have a lot of people on that can come on, sponsors, and we'll talk about what they're we're all doing. And that'll be on the Monday, the fourteenth of February. All right. So that's enough for me babbling, babbling for now. But let's look, just note that I'm really looking forward to uh, stepping it up this year for uh, for St. Jude. All right, let's do the giveaways. We got four tonight. Thank you for the monstrous 300% uh, uh, of a level five raid that we got earlier. Please note that the three individuals that did not get their adventures backpack yet, because Chuck has not got me the, the, the codes, I get to beat him. Well, I get to get suck more stuff out of him now because he's so late with these. Um, we got two more adventures backpacks. Crazy. And, Yes, I, I I bribe my sponsors all the time, and your choice of one of these three, uh, we'll do that twice. Okay, so you get your options. There's four different uh, items you can take here. Um, let me do this. Everyone in? Last call. Let's call for signups. All right, here we go. I'm closing it out. Dun, 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 dun. Remember, you got to be on to claim it unless you gave said uh, for a special reason you had to depart. What do I, I'm hitting. Please don't, Jay. Don't don't mess this up. I think you're in, Tino. Here we go. Oh, Doc, you got in. Doc. Yeah, yeah. Doc skirted him. Oh, he must have already been in. Yeah, you're already <laughs> in. Here we go. The first winner, DM David Keith. Not Keith oh, David, cool. the actor. But David <laughs> Keith from Officer and a Gentleman. That'd be a good get. Yeah. So, David Keith, DM. Are you on? And you tell me what you want. DM. I'm gonna make sure he's in chat. DM David. Keith. Oh, there he is. He's there. All right, David. Do you want? Do you want the ventures? Uh, let me put the ventures backpack up again. Do you want that or, or one of these books? You just tell me. Uh, I think I have your address already. So you let me know. One of these. One of these three books or um, or uh, one of the books. Which one? Paladin and Hell, Shady Dragon Inn, or uh, Abbasar? You take. Uh, I would. Uh, I would recommend this one. I would get the Paladin and Hell myself, just because it's cool. That's a cool one. All right, I'm going to put that down. If you change your mind, you let me know, okay? All right, so we got two Ventures backpacks and one of these uh, one of these two. Um, Jay can't find uh, the Ventures. Yep, Paladin and Hell, so, yep. Yeah, so okay, yeah. next one. All right, here we go. Next winner. By the way, thank you for all the support. We got 90 people on, on, a, on a Wednesday night, which is awesome. Next winner. Mac, you're getting you're getting the Avengers backpack because uh, I'm not shipping overseas to UK, so I can get that to you, Mac. All right, Big Mac. All right. Yes. Oh, very right. active. Right. Very you got the backpack. Movie. You got an Avengers backpack there because I can get that to you easily. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Shipping to England sucks right now. Yeah, I can't do that. But you got a winner. All right, so let me just put this down. David Keith. All right, and then next winner. All right, so I got one backpack left and one set of books here. Uh, one of the two books. Next winner, Tim Enoch Pratt. Tim Enoch Pratt, who's always a VIP. He's on. Um, and he, uh, yeah, yeah, he's a VIP. So I'm, um, awesome. I'm going to assume he's going to want Abstor, but uh, I'll talk to him. I know he said he had something. He, um, T Tim, which one do you want? Do you want Abysthor or Shady Dragon? I'm assuming you want Abysthor. It's one of the best uh, adventures of all time from uh, from uh, third edition, Sword and Sorcery. You just let me know if I, I guessed correctly. Last winner. Gotcha. M5 tie-in. Oh. Okay, M5, I got you for a, an adventurer's backpack. All right. 
Enoch Pratt. I will get you that. I think I may have your email just already. Um, just note that uh, Ch Chuck needs to get them to me, and as soon as I have them, uh, he said no later than tomorrow morning, I will start sh uh, getting them to everyone. You got it. Let's raid into Stella Luna. Vernon, Michael, thank you. Thank you. You are me. welcome. This was a blast. I am so happy you guys had a great time, and you're welcome back anytime, and we'll set that up for a future for a future show. Please, everyone, hang in there. Let's raid into Stella yeah, Luna. Thank you, everyone. It was Stella, awesome to have you here. Stella was, kind enough, to, Stella was kind enough to raid into uh, Gavin on Sunday night. So let's uh, let's get it going. I'll see you tomorrow night, 730, for a really cool adventure. Skeets is hideaway. Uh, it'll be uh, one character only for each of them, so it'll be a little different than my normal style. Uh, now I'm going to hit the wrong button. Here we go. Maybe not. See you all tomorrow night. Thanks. Thank you all Thank for you. setting up the raid. Thanks, everybody. Hey, and I, and I, ac I accidentally got uh, Tim snuck in with uh, ripping someone's tongue out. By the way, his. <laughs> by the way, uh, Did Michael. Did you miss that? That was his daughter uh, acting uh, the part of the tongue ripping out, by the way. That's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Okay. We can hear it, but the audio is fantastic. Yeah, the audio is hysterical. <laughs> Let's see if we get up to 80. They'll put our cell over 100. 75. All right, 75 is good. He has the best baby Albert. Yeah. Five, five four, yes, three, two, one. See you tomorrow night. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Just make sure it went. You guys are good. All right. That was awesome. Well, thank you, Great. everybody. Yeah. Hey, thank you, guys. Yeah, this thank is. Jay, it's always a pleasure being here. Wow. Yeah.